with the basketball. They'll bring it across. The clock will tick down. The Gamecocks are making history in Cleveland. They'll be the 10th team, the 5th program to go undefeated and win the national championship. They will avenge their loss to Iowa from last year. The clock ticks down. Two seconds to play. Celebration in Cleveland. Perfection wears garnet and black. The South Carolina Gamecocks complete their first perfect season with their third national championship. The best team in the nation will cut down the nets as the Gamecocks defeat Iowa 87-75 to here in Cleveland. The confetti falls from the sky. Celebration at midcourt. The Gamecocks are national champions again. Brad Muller on the call. What an amazing weekend for South Carolina basketball fans. Welcome in to this edition of the postgame show. We got what a day. Yeah, the eclipse, the celebration, 50 years of Hank Aaron. All kinds of stuff going on today. National championship game tonight, man. And a title game tonight. And then some dude is trying to steal the limelight. And we'll talk about him at some point as well. Shocking that guy would do this, Jay. <laughs> Welcome in. Uh, he's Terry Ford hanging over uh, for a little bit. Not hungover, hanging over. Yeah, well, a little both. Or both. Yeah, a little uh, both. both. Both can be true. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, nice to see you, sir. Elijah is down covering the women's celebration at Colonial Life Arena. He'll check in shortly. Uh, they started a little over a half hour ago. I love it, by the way. Uh, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, we've known Brad and his family a long time. His wife, Catherine, is a terrific math teacher and taught many of my children. Mm -hmm. So she's Mrs. Muller, and he's Mr. Muller. <coughs> and my daughter, who goes to Carolina, is there. And the first thing she texts me is, Mr. Muller is giving a speech. <laughs> Because <laughs> that's who I, I told him that the other day. I was like, "You realize you're Mr. Mo." He's like, "Hey, whatever they call me, I am Mr. Eh. You know, I'm, I, I'm, you know." So that's that's where it is. You'd be called a lot worse in life. You probably could. Eh. You probably eh. could. But uh, what a ball game yesterday! A, a terrific start for Iowa, South Carolina. You, you saw, dare I say, Terry Ford, uh, the mild glare on Dawn's face. No timeouts. Mm -mm. No timeouts. Play through it. And uh, actually, I guess at the end of the first, there was a, a talk. Mm -hmm. And from that point forward, South Carolina just locked down on defense. And uh, as they say, the rest is history. But South Carolina has made history. And it was a, just a, a, a tremendous performance from so many, which is what we've come to expect. I mean, the best team won the national championship. The undefeated team that was deep and a bunch of people sacrificing shots and, and, and stats to win games. A lot of McDonald's All-Americans, by the way, Jay. A lot. Who sacrifice a lot of shots to go win games. And the best team won the national championship. And I thought it was interesting that Dawn didn't call the timeout. Right. So get you through it. No, but I don't know, but let me ask you this real quick. They're down seven at the end of the first quarter. I'm like, they're okay. Oh, yeah. Everything's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Remember, they were down 11 twice. Yep. Twice. Mm -hmm. and it was 10. Then they scored. Then I think it was what ten to two. Then thirteen to two. And then I believe it was eighteen to seven. Um, and again, yeah, Caitlin hit that three at the end of the first to make it a seven point game. Mm -hmm. And like I said, at that point, South Carolina never, you know, just did that. I don't want to say they didn't get concerned. I mean, Iowa was going to make a couple of runs. One of the things I thought was most interesting, uh, you know, when you look at the greatness of, of Caitlin Clark, I think she's the kind of competitor, uh, as she gets frustrated in the rare moments when they did lose, because they didn't lose very much. But you and I have talked about this guy before, uh, or this girl before, if you will, that wants it all back at once. Mm -hmm. And I, I think sometimes not only can she make those, as they call them, logo threes, mm -hmm. I think in her mind, and I, I don't mean this literally, but she's like, all right, this is a, this, I'm going to hit a 10 point shot. You know, I mean, she just, she wants it all sure. back so badly. You can sense a level of frustration. I'm not going to say that she was rattled yesterday, but the way South Carolina was defending her and frustrating her, you know, she wanted some of those to be that kind of shot, you know, that, yeah. that kind of thing. Again, we see it with quarterbacks a lot. I'm going to go throw a 21 point touchdown. Now, I guess what, dude? It's still going to be six. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the play to me that signified the frustration of Caitlin Clark when she gets her pocket picked by Raven Johnson. Yeah. And Raven Johnson goes in coast to coast and lays a ball. Were you surprised? Maybe she shouldn't have. I was almost surprised that Kate, Caitlin didn't go Fowler. 
I mean, she just kind of just stopped. Yeah. But she doesn't really defend. I'm not. That's not a knock. That's okay. Let let the four other four on the right. floor defend. We, you we do need your you job. We need you to go do a lot of yeah. offense you, because you score and pass, and and we'll be fine. Yeah. I just it was it was that play was like you don't see that happen to Caitlin Clark. Uh. Uh-uh. That doesn't happen. And Raven Johnson, the unsung hero of that victory yesterday. Well, Raven. I, I, I got to think, man, I'm serious. You know, they, they talked about the revenge tour, and then, you know, yesterday it's over. Um, but I do think last year maybe we finally saw it fully manifest yesterday. Raven took that personally last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whether she should or shouldn't is is up to the beholder. She did, uh, and she thinks she should have, but it, it paid dividends ultimately. But I, I think she was absolutely, you know, uh, completely and fully determined to be the lockdown defender that she was yesterday when it, when she needed to be. The best one for 11 day anybody will ever have. Right. How funny is that? Well, because, again, just we we got scores. Yep. You know, you go, go you chase. Go, go chase that Clark You go play around. defense. Yeah. yeah. And Tessa Johnson, I mean, you know, you had – and don't forget, I mean, here's two freshmen coming off the bench. You know, Malaysia had had a couple of games where she wasn't at her best. Uh, Tessa had, I think, at one point done done some nice things already in this tournament, uh, but she had a day yesterday. And and man, a couple of those threes, Terry, I mean, hardly even hit the net. They were so crisp. <laughs> and and I I thought about the sound that like two of them made. The one the one on the long pass where she was just there at the elbow. Mm-hmm. I was like, that might have been the most pure shot I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, it, it there's. I could, it just, it like, like, you know, when divers in the Olympics, like, there's just a little splash. A little, little splash. That's what she did. Oh, yeah. On a yeah. couple of, there was just like, I like tell you, the development of, of Tessa Johnson through this season is one of those under the radar things until, like, you see it yesterday and you're like, man, she's good. Because oh. everything's about Full Wally because yeah. Full Wally just comes in and changes the game. Yeah. And then, you know, Tessa Johnson, how big was she uh, hitting that three against Oregon State after Raven hits the one three? Tessa comes back, hits the second three, and everything settled down. Yeah. She's made some big shots. She's had some really nice games here down the stretch. But she gets so lost with everybody else, like Tahina Pow Pow. That's what she was brought here for yesterday, right? Right. right. Knock down threes. Because Iowa can't play you the way they did last year. Because you can make them pay. And Tessa and Tahina Pow Pow made them pay from three. And South Carolina did. Uh, ultimately, after a brilliant first quarter, Iowa for the game con- uh, concluded with 39.7% from the floor. Mm-hmm. Uh, about the same percentage, give or take, from three. Uh, South Carolina was much closer to 50%. Again, I, there are so many things that we will discuss throughout the day. Two things that stand out perhaps above any other. One, South Carolina 51, Iowa 29 in the rebounding mm-hmm. department. Um, but maybe even bigger, and I know many of you have heard this one already, but just to remind you, bench points. South Carolina 37, Iowa 0. Yep. I mean... Yeah, those those things. And I I saw one pundit this morning, I forget who, say it was going to take a miracle. Tim Legler uh, it said it was going to take a miracle for Iowa. He, he likened it in some ways to Villanova beating Georgetown. I might not go quite that far. Um, Iowa, I couldn't, I don't know that I could equate yesterday's Iowa team or this season's Iowa team with that Villanova team. Mm. Now, South Carolina might be as powerful as Georgetown. Um, but no, none of the Iowa players were stoned, <laughs> or whatever they were. Whatever Gary McClain yeah, was, I think it was. I think it was the opposite, man. I think it was. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll, we'll worry about that. But uh, th- those things just amazing. And two double doubles yesterday, Camilla yeah. and Chloe, with yeah, double doubles. And Chloe Kitts had a game, and she hit a couple of shots from outside yeah. as well. It, it's so funny too. She because this is way this team is. You know, Chloe Kitts has had some magnificent games this year. But she's not asked to be that person every game. In some games, the matchup just doesn't favor Chloe Kitts, and you're going to see more Ashlyn Watkins. And then you're going to see Fagan sometimes. And there's just this rotation of of players. And you look up and you go, oh, oh, Watkins pulled 20 boards against NC State. I mean, just this rotation of of quality front court players that just come at you in waves. And, oh, by the way, yeah, Cardo's a 6'7". Yeah. I mean, it's just and, – and then you look at the backcourt and how deep they are in the backcourt. I mean, just watching this thing develop this year, you're just sitting around going, I feel like, I felt like, and, I, and Tyler kept saying this to Tyler through the year, I think the only team that's going to beat South Carolina is South Carolina. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They're just so good. Well, I think, uh, well, I know Elijah and I did, and you and I might have talked off air about it. Dawn, uh, the week before the tournament, did an interview with Dan Patrick on his mm-hmm. show. 
And the one of the last things he asked her that morning was, um, you know, "What what will be? Who will beat you? Or how will you get beat? How will you not win this?" And she said, "If we beat ourselves, no, yeah. Um, I mean, she knows. They, everybody knows. Yeah, it's just, and it's not bragging no. you know, per se. I mean, some people may see it that way, but um, it's just the truth. I mean, when you've got that kind of bench play, and yes, you lose Camilla, and you're going to lose a couple of others. You know, but Joyce Edwards rolls right in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, and she's got such a all around. She's the she's the modern all around player. She can go down low. She can she can step out. She can defend, um, and I think she'll work her way right into yeah. this rotation. And if you you keep the core of this, I mean, you're scary again. You lose Cordoza, you're right, but you've got fr you've got front court depth of talent. Your backcourt's loaded. Pow Pow's coming back for she one is. more year. You got Raven. You got Tessa Fawali. I mean, think about the riches you have, and you've had, we don't even talk about Hall, right? Who also has hit some big shots? Look, you don't win the LSU game in Baton Rouge without Hall banging big threes down the stretch. Two of them. Again, that second one made that place go funeral quiet. <laughs> it was, man. It was. It was like it was like, oh wow. Yeah, Breeze. we're in the library at LSU. I did not right. know that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Every almost everybody is coming back. Yeah. And again, you add literally add the best player in America who's from thirty minutes away. Yeah. So that's that's. Uh, so you're saying they're going to be okay next year? I think they will. Yeah, look, the target gets even bigger if sure. it can. But we, you know, we've seen two massive dynasties in this sport. The interesting thing for me now is how different it's going to be for Dawn and her coaching staff and and her players certainly uh, in trying to do something. And again, what I'm getting ready to say isn't a knock. It's it's how it happened. When Pat Summit was doing her thing, there just weren't a lot of schools that could compete with her. Mm -hmm. When Gino began to build his, really, it was Pat that could compete with him right. or they with each other. Notre Dame, Stanford, certainly. Tara Vanderveer's won three titles. Mm -hmm. Then the rise of Kim Mulkey with her three titles at Baylor. But now, I think with what? someone like Caitlin Clark has done to inspire more girls and then to inspire more schools to invest in this sport, the parody will will spread quickly. Listen, Terry, in a lot of ways, I, I equate it to what we saw with college baseball. I mean, when, when LSU did what they did, uh, it really got to a point of like, man, are, we better start spending on this. And then you saw South Carolina do what they did to go to six tournaments in, what, a 10-year span, play for the title four times, more SEC schools were doing it, Vandy started spending money, Florida said, okay, we'll really start to spend money. Now you've seen schools in the ACC. The, the talent spreads out. And, and you can be the, the best X and O coach ever, but Dawn is doing it with both. Gino yeah. did it with both. Pat did it with both. I will, I will out-coach you, and my players are all better than you. Look at Nick Saban's six titles. I'm a better coach than you, and my players are better than you. Can Dawn continue? I think she can to maintain that kind of thing to where her dynasty becomes something like what Pat and Gino have done. I think that now becomes for her and for this program, one of the challenges they'll want to take on. Yeah, I mean, look, what you want, what you have now, Caitlin Clark did something for your sport. No one else ever could love or hate or whatever. Doesn't matter. The fact is this sport had a player where the casual fans stopped to watch. Yeah. Now you build upon it. Yep. Now you can't let that momentum go away because if this player goes away, others have to step in that spot now to keep those people engaged. So that's the next step for women's basketball. It's gotten a wonderful door open for them. Now you need to take advantage of that. And who's next person up, so to speak? Yeah. Well, it's going to be fun. Juju Watkins doing her thing at Southern California. Listen, Malaysia yesterday, if that if that little behind-the-back thing, do -si do that she had done had gone in, that's the play of the weekend in sports. And she had one of those already. That was a lot of fun. Uh, we'd love to hear from you guys on this. we got plenty of sound. Again, Elijah's down at the arena covering the celebration. We'll get into the other big uh, basketball story of the weekend uh, as well. But uh, it'll be a lot about Carolina winning their third women's national championship. 803-404-6100. This is the Post Game Show.
Hey, let me tell you about my great friends at Kato's Power Equipment. Ben and his family have owned this business for more than 40 years now, right here in Columbia, 4012 West Beltline Boulevard. Matt and the crew uh, take great care of me when I'm in there. I uh, use my Toro Time Master this weekend. It was a lot of fun because that means I got to do my yard work uh, and cut the grass in about half the time. And they've got so many things on the showroom floor right now to help you out, whether you are the backyard landscaper that does it for yourself, whether you're the landscaper that does it for a living, they get in there for excellent sales service and advice. Uh, some closeout models to save you some money, renting a lot of equipment now, whether you already know exactly what it is or something that you want to try out, especially some of these battery operated uh, pieces of equipment now, whether it's hedge trimmers, blowers chainsaws and of course riding or push mowers they've got it all for you check them out online too kato's power equipment.com family owned since 1983 that's kato's power equipment Hawkeyes can work for the final shot to take the lead into the locker room. But Raven Johnson steals it from Caitlin Clark. She will drive the length of the floor and lay it up and in. And the Gamecocks lead 49-46. Here's Stokey across midcourt to Caitlin Clark. Feeds it out left side. They're not going to get a shot off. The Gamecocks rally from an 11-point deficit and will take a three-point lead into the locker room here in the national championship. Brad Muller on the call yesterday. That steal and a lay-in at uh, just before the half. 
I, I can't tell you that was the difference maker, the backbreaker, anything like that. But in terms of a just brief moment that could so dramatically shift momentum, uh, I absolutely think it was something that gave each team something very different all of a sudden to think about at halftime. I think it was kind of a microcosm more of the defense that Raven Johnson was playing on Caitlin Clark pretty much from the second quarter on in that game to where they forced her to be uncomfortable. They forced her to turn the ball over, and they capitalized on those turnovers, and that was a perfect example of that. It was. Uh, and, again, just, just a magnificent day all around defensively for Carolina after – that that Iowa burst um and as you heard Brad say there it remembers 10 nothing but it was 13 to 2 and it was 18 to 7 yeah South Carolina was down 11 points twice but there was no reason to panic it's a four quarter game and again you, you saw Dawn not call timeouts she doesn't she doesn't do that I mean it's very rare meanwhile for whatever it may be worth and again no judgment here uh Lisa Bluter called two timeouts when things were getting ready to get out of hand trying to slow South Carolina's momentum, if you will. But it was just really about wave after wave of defense. And again, the two things that stand out to me above any other, 51-29 rebounding edge and South Carolina, 37 bench points, Iowa, zero. And Tessa Johnson led the Gamecocks with 19 of those bench points, over half of the bench points from Tessa, who was just brilliant yesterday. And we knew that was going to be the big advantage for South Carolina, regardless of who they were facing this weekend, because they were the only team that did have a deep bench. NC State didn't have one. Iowa didn't have one. UConn didn't have one. So we knew, especially playing in that second game of the national championship after whatever opponent they were going to be facing had played a tough game on Friday night less than 48 hours before, that depth was going to play to their advantage. It certainly didn't yesterday. Let me go back real quick. I, I, I retweeted this the other day. I, I have to go all the way back to uh, before the Final Four. Our buddy Chris Deering put this out. Um, this is bench points for the four teams that advanced in terms of what they did in their Sweet 16 and Elite 8 games. Iowa, 10 points, 11 rebounds. Connecticut, 13 points, 4 rebounds. NC State, 24 points, 9 rebounds. South Carolina, 61 points, 34 rebounds. South Carolina alone had more bench points and bench rebounds combined than the other three teams in the Final Four. Yeah, and again, we know... And that to be a strength of this team all year long, and so many different girls have stepped up at different times this year to where you can have a Tessa Johnson being a leading scorer off the bench. You can have Camila Cardoso being your leading scorer and leading rebounder, whatever it may be. They're truly a sum of their parts, not just one superstar player surrounded by complementary pieces. Yeah, no, I mean, so many uh, that are good. And again, you don't lose much from this team. You do lose Camilla inside. Uh, and look, you, you might, I, I, I'm not predicting this. You, you may have transfers. You may not. I don't know. Uh, you get the best player out of high school coming into your program. There's, there's certainly that. Uh, but you don't lose much off of, uh, off of a team that just went 38-0. Uh, we'll, we'll come back around to that. I do want to, for a second here, get to the other major basketball story in the country, and we'll mm -hmm. spend some time on this uh, here and there. Uh, by now, I think most of you have heard, but uh, shocking. Uh, well, I'm rarely shocked anymore. Uh, but if only because of the timing, and I'll explain what I mean, I was shocked to hear that John Calipari is leaving Kentucky and will sign a five-year deal to become the new head coach of the Arkansas Razorbacks. He's going to sign an $8.5 million per year deal, which is about what he's making. At least that's the word. Mm -hmm. But it will also be incentive-laden uh, in terms of you know getting him extra money. The reason I say shocking is because while this had been rumored in terms of unrest, well, let's put it this way. There are no rumors when it comes to the unrest. Right. There was unrest from the fan base, from the administration, from Cal himself. Uh, you know, you've not made a Final Four in eight years. That's too long at Kentucky. Um, Mitch Barnhart, their longtime AD, had come out and said, you know, Cal is staying. And then we saw guys like Nate Oates, who might have been uh, a major candidate, sign a new deal to stay at, at Alabama. Um, and then you saw Arkansas interview, well, not interview per se, I guess, but, but talk with both Chris Beard of Ole Miss and Jerome Tang of Kansas state. And both right. those men stayed at their jobs. Right. So then you thought, okay, well, I mean, cause wouldn't you call John Calipari first? Yeah. You right. Would, like that's, you would, you would that's think. what you would think. <laughs> right. And so at that point it was 
I, I, I don't know who reached out to whom, but I wonder if this isn't something similar, Tyler, to the story that I've heard about how Frank Martin got to South Carolina. Mm -hmm. South Carolina was prepared to hire someone else. Um, from what I've heard, it, they were very, South Carolina was 90 plus percent of the way to getting Kevin Stallings to leave Vanderbilt and come to South Carolina. Okay. And as it's been told to me, Frank, who had uh, an issue with his AD at the time, John Curry, who ultimately went to Tennessee and is now at Wake Forest, they just they didn't get along. But Frank's people reached out to South Carolina. Like, I'd be interested in your job if you'd be interested in me. Right. Did Cal do – and, again, that's, that's, what, that's how it's been told to me. That was a long time ago now. But um, did Cal do something similar? Did he tell his agent, hey – you know what? Call call them. Just let's see what's up. Right, right. It's entirely plausible. And, you know, this relationship with Kentucky kind of seems to have been fractured for a little while. And, you know, Terry kind of equated it to the couple that's, you know, still living together but sleeping in separate beds, right. staying together for the children type of thing. Right. Um, where you knew, like, it, outside of him making a deep run in the tournament the next year or so, it was probably going to end at some point anyway. So he figured, why not cut his losses and go ahead and go? Let me ask you this question, though. When you first saw this, whether it be on a tweet or a text or whatever, did you think it wasn't true? Did you think it was just totally made up? I, well, I don't know if I thought it was totally made up, but it was one of those, like, wait, what? Because yeah. the first, I actually, I didn't see it on Twitter. I, I got the alert. Okay. All right. Well, maybe that's a little more so, believable. Because I, I try to, on especially on a Sunday night, I try to just... I got it. I'll, I'll tell you a Twitter story in a little bit. Okay. Uh, but I, so I, no, I got the alert. I was like, wait, huh? Yeah. Like, where'd that, uh, that's why. And then I, I it's just like, no, no. Right. Wait. Like, so yeah, I guess so to some degree. Sure. Cause you're thinking like, that doesn't make sense. Right. Uh, um, uh, you know, again, who reached out to whom? I, I would, you know, maybe we find out, maybe we don't. Does it matter? I, I don't know. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> Cal's too busy walking his dog to talk to anybody. Today. Yeah. That's good. The, and, of course, this now begs the even larger question, perhaps, and that is who becomes the new head coach at Kentucky. I, I get what some people are saying. I, I think I saw Andy Staples say this, and maybe maybe Feinbaum said it too. Well, hey, Kentucky just, and I'm air quoting, saved $33 million by not firing him. Well, do they have a $33 million John Calipari buyout fund at some bank in Lexington? Because, uh, my, you know, I, I could they afford it if they wanted to? Yeah, but sure. But maybe the reason, Tyler, that they didn't fire him. Because they didn't have it. It's because they don't want to pay $33 million to do it. Which is understandable. And, and the point I'm going to make here is Nate Oates, just as I mentioned, you know, this is one of the things that makes this shocking in terms of who Kentucky could potentially target. And it could, look, Kentucky didn't say, well, maybe they did. You know, I always wonder like, hey, hey, John, we'll help you pack. There, there's a lot of details to come out about this that are going to be interesting. But Nate Oates, a couple of weeks ago, had a $10 million buyout. Yes. Nate Oates just re-upped and now has an $18 million buyout. Right. Now, so, so again, some pundits are saying that's a $15 million net gain for Kentucky in terms mm. of paying a buyout. Sure. Now, can you – and if I'm Alabama, am I going to work with Kentucky to, no. say, structure a Nate Oates buyout over X amount of years? Probably not. I wouldn't. No. And does Nate want that job? You know who – well, we'll talk about it later. But I, I got somebody else down that way that might actually be better for Kentucky. 803-404-6100. So that's out there. Come back on the other side. Uh, a lot more on Carolina's victory over Iowa, their third national championship under Dawn Staley. This is the Monday Post Game Show.
Um, don't let us score. I mean, I, I was ready. I was ready for the moment, and I take defense very hard. Like I take it to heart, and I think I studied her moves, and I was ready. I had confidence this year. I mean, I was telling myself la last year is not going to happen again. So. Raven Johnson on guarding Caitlin Clark. Uh, Raven, 37 minutes. Uh, only made one of her 11 field goal attempts. Was one of two from the line, but she had four steals and three assists yesterday. Committed just two fouls while playing uh, the kind of defense that she played. Caitlin Clark got hers yesterday. Uh, 10 of 28 from the floor, including 5 of 13 from three. But remember, she had 30 points total. 18 of them. We're in the first quarter. Yeah, I think that's the kind of stat line you'd want from somebody like her. Again, you know she's going to score a fair amount of points. Making her get those 30 points on 28 shots, I think, is about where South Carolina wanted to keep her under 50% from the field. And the big stat that sticks out to me is she didn't make uh, more than – she made – two three-pointers over the course of the last three quarters of the game, right. which really stands out because, again, she was hitting everything that moved in that first quarter. She had like. the, yeah, she had the one three in the second quarter. Um, went, I think she went 0 for in the third. Yeah, and then and she had a couple. You know, again, she was taking shots. You could, you could tell she was <sighs> frustrated. I yeah. mean, and she yeah. was, you know. But, but like I said earlier to you and Terry, she – I, I think she was trying to hit 10-point shots. I think in her mind, she wanted – she was like, I got to find a way to do this now. Right, right. Um, and, again, it, that's obviously something that can't be done. And that's – I think that's that's where Carolina should should feel really good about how they played. They, they frustrated her, not to the point of, you know, doing stupid stuff, but it just – Iowa was in a hole they could not climb out of. I yeah. think they got one little push for a second – and I think they got it to either six. I think they, they got, got it down to six, six in the fourth quarter. And then that's when Cardoso had a block and a putback, and yeah. they put him up by eight. And that was like right at two minutes to go, and that kind of sealed it from there. Um, again, the, the the rebounding edge, South Carolina 51-29, broken down. Uh, South Carolina 33 defensive, 18 offensive boards, uh, 22 defensive, and seven offensive rebounds yesterday for Iowa uh, I mean South Carolina's height advantage mm -hmm. and not just not just height advantage South Carolina studying what they were going to do in terms of positioning uh, they do this a lot sure. offensive rebounding listen you're going to miss can you get your putbacks and I think that especially Camilla and Chloe and Ashlyn have all I, I I say those three others have done it as well but those are your bigs um, they're just they're very good at staying with it uh, and have been all season long yeah. right uh that that to me is just something that more than anything else just stands out again the, the rebounding edge and, and the bench points those those were the things but south carolina uh, does make history they are the 10th undefeated national champion uh, south carolina uh, or excuse me dawn staley rather becomes the fifth head coach with uh, at least three national titles uh the others are pat summit gino oriama tara vandeveer of stanford kim mulkey and now Dawn. That's that, right. That's it. And I mean, South Carolina's got the dynasty right now. Three they, and eight years. Yeah. And and I mentioned this earlier. You know, now I think, and I'm not saying they can't or anything like that. Look, I, I like I say, this team is going to be loaded with talent next season. Um, and they will be the the number one team going in. Sure. There's nobody else out there that's going to challenge them to be the number one team in the country next year. Doesn't mean they will be the number one team in the country at the end of the season. Sure. But going into the preseason, it, South Carolina it, will be number one in the country. There is not going to be the doubt that we had, not that we had, but from a national perspective, people had on them going into this past year, and rightfully so, because you replaced the best class of athletes yeah. that you've ever had in women's basketball. It was understandable to think, okay, there's going to be a little bit of a drop off. Even that, they still had them at six, which means you're at least going to the Elite Eight. So that's a drop off that a lot of you know right. teams would take from around the country. But um, you know, and I think that's what makes this game, this series or season and more special and Don Staley talked about it yesterday after the um after the game because you came so close and you were heartbroken on nearly having your unbeaten season with the freshie class you know being sent out that way to the loss at Iowa and then coming into this year with a whole new crop of starters and, and new girls coming in as freshmen and not really knowing what it was going to be like and you went from point A to point B completely unblemished Let's hear some. Uh, we got a lot to get to from Dawn. Uh, Tyler's worked hard on this. Cut nine, uh, Mr. Head. Uh, this is uh, a little extended cut from Dawn on why the depth was so crucial to her team's success. I mean, it's, you know, to have a, you know, have a roster that goes nine, ten deep. 
um, is it's a it's a it's a privilege. It really is, um, but it has to be developed slowly and the right way. Like there's a lot of trust that has to be built because there's some there's some games that. Um, some of them won't play a whole lot, especially the people that come, that's coming off the bench. You know, I mean, Chloe Kitts went up and down and, you know, all around. Um, and then finally she settled in today to have a really good game. But she had to come off the bench at times um, because of not what she, you know, not what she wasn't doing, but was more about what somebody was doing and doing well. Um, and that could shake your confidence. But at the same time, you have to, let her know the way you build trust in our coaching staff. It's the same way your, you know, your, your competitors building trust. Um, I think Malaysia Fuwali has been very patient with us to to be able to have a, you know, household name um, coming off the bench, playing maybe you know, probably less than 20 minutes a game, uh, where she could have gone anywhere else in the country. And they've given her the ball time and time again. But winning the national championship will allow us and that relationship to continue to grow. Because um, I know she, she really wanted this. And I would imagine that come as early as next year, she's going to want to be a starter. She's going to want to be um, play more minutes. She's going to want a lot of different things because she got the big one. Um, so now she'll maybe want to concentrate on some individual awards. And I appreciate her sacrifice. So it's everybody. It's Sanaya Fagan who, I mean, she's a junior. And she's probably started less than 10 times. Um, but she came up crucial this game, like really. And I, I know she's probably wanted to play a lot more throughout the season. Um, but I hold her to her standard. I hold her to her her personal and individual standard to sometimes that that's, that equates to six minutes or five minutes or less. And it doesn't feel good, but in order for us to do what we do today means she's got to meet her standard. And, and, and we don't, and, and we don't sacrifice that. So it's built through trusting the process. Yeah. It's built through like yeah. really high level communication. Some that they may not like all the time, but it's it's truth. But we also want we want them to talk to us about what they're feeling and seeing, um, so we can so we can understand them and how they how they operate in that space. So we don't want to miss anything. We don't want to mess anything up, but we also want to give them an opportunity to tell us what they're thinking and how they're processing information or if we're giving them the right information. So it's a long-winded answer, sorry. That was a great answer, though, and I think it's just it's it's good to hear that, whether you are an ardent Carolina fan or an interested third-party observer in terms of how someone like Dawn Staley, who is a bona fide you know, rock star in the sport uh, and was before she ever stepped foot on the campus of the University of South Carolina, uh, handles this because this is what she does. She goes and recruits elite talent. Um, yeah, I, I, I joke a lot. Dawn's never home. Want to know why? Because she's, she, she's out recruiting. ABC always be recruiting. I mean, she is man, and she all, and, and that's what she does. But then she, as you hear there, she has to convince incredibly talented players to to you know take on a role, right, and live it. And sometimes that role will change. You mentioned somebody like Chloe Kitts. Or, again, you know, you got Malaysia Fulwiley and Tessa Johnson coming off the bench. They start at 99% of schools. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, South Carolina's bench four or five is better than probably 90% of the teams in the country. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously, man. And, you know, I, again, this is not now this is more my opinion. Uh, and I'm certainly not knocking somebody like Juju Watkins, who had a hell of a year for Southern California. But... It, Malaysia full again as a freshman I'm talking about but if Malaysia y'all think about that play that Malaysia made uh that like got Magic Johnson who by the way has always been a Carolina women's mm -hmm. basketball fan because his sister played here right um but you know got people like that talking and again that play she almost put that ball in yesterday yep if she's playing 32 35 minutes a game she's making more of those and getting yeah. on the highlight reel she's oh, the freshman she's, of the year she's 
positioning herself to be the next superstar yeah. of women's basketball. Yeah. And I think she she has a real shot at it here coming up. Uh, we know TV viewership has been fantastic for women's basketball. Another signal on the growth of the sport I will tell you about as the postgame show continues. Welcome back in. Post game show continues on this Monday. Jay Phillips, Tyler Head, Elijah will be back here shortly, uh, straight from <laughs> Cleveland to CLA for the celebration. Elijah's had a day. Has the boy slept? Um, so I talked to him at one fifteen when he was on with me and Terry, and I could hear the fatigue in his voice. He said he power napped, uh -huh. but I think he was up at like four to catch his flight out of Cleveland. Yeah. So probably didn't get a lot of sleep last night. So he he may be a little groggy when he gets in here. Uh, can he expense a five-hour energy or two? To the I actually company? have one in my bag if he wants to borrow it. I'll ask him when he gets here. I'll just give it to him. Yeah, probably a good idea. <laughs> 
he'll, he'll trade you. Yeah, I, I use them quite frequently. Uh, so Richard Deitch of The Athletic, uh, who covers sports media, he and Andrew Marshawn for that publication slash website, uh, says, I'm hearing from TV sources that South Carolina, Iowa, set a new record for the most watched women's college game ever. Not a surprise, he writes. Viewership expected between 16 and 19 million. Don't have an exact number yet. Uh, I expect ESPN to officially announce later today. But Richard and Andrew, uh, along with John Oran, just two, uh, really three of the best at covering sports media. I didn't think... Friday night was going to be able to eclipse what they did in the Elite Eight on Monday. And for anybody that knows anything about TV viewership, Monday's a great time. There's a reason we have Monday Night Football because you have a captive audience. You get great viewership. And a 7 o'clock tip between Iowa and uh, and LSU was going to do great numbers, 13.2 million. A 9.30 tip on Friday between Iowa and UConn, as powerful as those programs are, I didn't think was going to be able to eclipse that, and it did. So this game being at 3 o'clock on a Sunday with no head-to-head competition would not surprise me if it lands in the 16 to 19 million range. Yeah, uh, remarkable. Uh, so that that's one. Here's another way to gauge the interest in a sport. How many people are betting on it? It's also, yeah, it's pretty good. The South Carolina-Iowa game was the most bet women's college basketball game ever. Uh, Doug Greenberg covers sports betting for ESPN. Uh, He says uh, the the ESPN bet says Sunday's contest took 20% more bets than Friday's game. FanDuel said it took 22% more money. Caesars says the book took double the handle of the previous record, the handle being the amount of money that was wagered overall on either team. Right. Um, The South Point Casino sports book says that Sunday's contest took as many tickets as either of the men's final four games and had a handle, quote, similar to a well-bet college football game. Uh, FanDuel also notes that the 24 title game, Carolina-Iowa, saw a 155% increase in handle and a 205% increase in ticket count compared to last year's Iowa-LSU game. So, uh, uh, listen, people like betting on popular sports, but if you don't want to, you're not going to, right? This is is a way, like anything else, to gauge this. Um, The NCAA tournament... Uh, was huge this year for women's sports. Two factors certainly were more coverage and a a bona fide generational megastar. Yeah, absolutely. And you're not going to bet on things. I'm not a better, but I imagine you're not going to bet on things that you don't have any interest or knowledge of because you want to make sure you're making a smart bet, obviously. So I think that speaks volumes to the overall interest in the game of women's college basketball that we've seen grow with ratings and with interest and social media stuff over the course of these past couple months. And, you know, where it goes from here, we'll see. But but this has been such a pivotal year and very cool for South Carolina to come out on top at the end of it. Um, Caesars, uh, Grant Tucker, said uh, he who works for Caesars, says the betting handle follows wherever she, Caitlin Clark, goes. Uh, will it translate to the WNBA regular season? We'll see. Uh, will interest wane in women's college basketball without somebody like her to some degree, perhaps. But again, now that there's been a focus on it, uh, will Juju Watkins and Malaysia Full Wiley and, and other star, you know, Paige Becker's now f- returning to full health and sure. she's going back to Connecticut next year. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see ha- how it goes. Uh, there's no doubting that Caitlin Clark is like nothing else we've seen. Oh, no, without a doubt. I mean, she's going to go down as one of the greatest of all time for what she accomplished on the court, but she's going to be remembered as one of the most popular for all of all time, just for existing in this era with social media and stuff like that, where you can, your fame can spread a lot more quickly. And, and obviously has garnered a lot of attention from, you know, within her own sport, but also across the sports landscape, yeah. LeBron and Magic Johnson, all these people tweeting about her and all that kind of stuff. And it just kind of, you know, shows how big of a deal she was. And, you know, one of those people that we're going to say, Oh, I remember watching Caitlin right. Clark when she was in college and talking about that, for years to come, no matter what she does at the WNBA level. Well, I, I do think that as well, when she gets to the next level, um, you know, will she be invited to be part of All-Star Weekend, three-point shooting contests, things like that, skills competitions, you know? She, she's always going to have that crossover appeal. Yeah. 
and she's going to exist in the sports realm. She's probably going to be on a desk for the national championship game next year, like right. Leah Boston was, you know, over the weekend. So she's going to still continue to be very much at the forefront. Um, you know, she moves on to the next level, which their draft is a week from now. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Um, I'm, I'm anxious to see if she's going to make the United States Olympic team. Easier said than done. I mean, she's great, so, but it, it, there are it, so many great players yeah. that, are, that are in their, you know, mid to late 20s. And she had to, it was the was the camp that she had to miss out on by going to the Final yeah, Four? Yeah, you know, and I suppose somebody can wave a magic wand. Yeah, I, they, if they, they can make it happen. But, um, I, and, and I'm not saying she couldn't compete at a very high level, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see on that one. By the way, South Carolina has been installed as the betting favorite for next season's title at plus 250. No doubting this time around. So there you go. All right. Lots more to do as the second hour comes at you, including an interview with Coach Kingston after the weekend series with A&M. Be right back. I want to tell you about Dr. Dan Balknight and his fantastic team at the men's clinic out in Irmo. I, I know Dan. I know what kind of doctor he is. Uh, I know what kind of person he is. And he is someone who gets to know the men in his practice so that he can help them out individually. This is not something where it's, hey, come in. Here's a pill. Here's a shot. Hope you feel better. It's not like that at all at the men's clinic. He wants you to lead a longer, stronger, healthier life but you can't do the same things you did in your 40s 50s and 60s that you did in your teens and 20s dr dan and his staff will get you comprehensive lab work take a look at what's going on again talk with you about your daily habits and life and then figure out a plan that's right for you to get you back to feeling fantastic every single day set up a free consultation 803-875-MENS or learn more online at the men's clinic sc.com Check Dr. Dan Block Knight out. He's great.
She means a lot to me. I feel like um, since the first day I got to South Carolina, she's been working so hard to get me ready and prepare for moments like this. And I'm just so thankful to have her as a coach. Um, she's like an inspiration for me and a lot of young girls out there. And I'm just so thankful to have her as a coach. She's the best in business, you already know. Camilla Cardoso named the most outstanding player of the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament yesterday. 15 points, 17 rebounds, and three blocks as the Gamecocks beat Iowa 87-75. to 38-0 on the season. Third program national championship and already the betting favorite to win another one next season. Welcome back into the postgame show. Jay Phillips, Tyler Head in for Elijah for a little bit on this Monday. Wait, you know what? He might be asleep somewhere in the, you know, bowels of Colonial Life Arena right now, and that's okay. He just found a cot. Probably did. You know, curl up in the nice cool corner somewhere back there. You know, they got those rooms in the back, like the yeah, recruiting yeah. room, yeah. And like, you know, places for yeah. like when, when like concerts a, come. Find a training table or yeah. something like that in the locker room, and yeah, you're out. He might have. He's had a he's had a week. Um, Should we text him and just see if he responds? <laughs> you think maybe he's asleep at the wheel at his car? Oh, I hope not. That, that wouldn't be good. It's not a it's not a long drive. It's, I mean, it's right there. No, it is. So. It's right, right there. Well, but still. Yeah. Yeah. If it if it gets to four thirty, uh -huh. then maybe we should be a little concerned. <laughs> we'll send somebody out to go get him. We'll text Diana. We'll text Dawn. Yeah, yeah. Like, hey, y'all. Hey, do you see a, a, see a large text? bearded man? Potentially asleep somewhere. Text Brad. Brad, or Brad. How about Brad getting to be the star of the show on the SEC Network, you know, kicking things off and introducing the team? Brad's the man. Life moment. Great uh, great stuff for him yesterday, too. Again, congratulations to Dawn Staley's team. Uh, you know, bench play speaks for itself. 37 to nothing bench points for South Carolina. Tessa Johnson leading the Gamecocks with 19 off the bench. Uh, rebounding edge, 51-29. to 29. Camilla and Chloe Kitts with double-doubles yesterday. Raven uh, and others, but Raven Johnson especially taking it upon herself to frustrate Caitlin Clark. Caitlin that got hers. She got 30 points. Uh, it's right around her season average, but she got 18 of those points in the first quarter. And then South Carolina played lockdown D the rest of the way. Whatever the message might have been. Again, Dawn doesn't like to call timeouts to, you know, stop the momentum or whatever it might be. Uh, she'll wait until the natural stoppages of play typically come in. And then at that point, uh, Caitlin had hit that uh, three to go from 15 to 18 and 27-20 at the end of the first quarter. Whatever the message was, worked. Yeah. The rest of the way. And they knew what the message was. There was it, no reason to panic. Well, and we know South Carolina is a team that just kind of squeezes you into submission in the second half of the game. So even if they were down at halftime, I don't think that would have been a reason for a lot of panic. And that goes back to Raven with that, you know, being able to pick Caitlin Clark's pocket right there and get that score to put them up uh, 49 to 46 at halftime as opposed to that would have it was setting up for Iowa to at least maybe be up 47, 46 at halftime instead. And what that does for momentum going into the second half was huge. And obviously South Carolina was able to uh, roll and uh, start pulling away there as they got later into the game. Again, down seven after one, as Tyler just mentioned, up three at the break, but second quarter score 29, 19 Gamecocks, third quarter score 19, 13 Gamecocks, fourth quarter score 19, 16 at Gamecocks. I will admit, and again, this isn't a criticism, just an observation. Um, uh, I guess right as the game hit its final minute, give or take, maybe 50 seconds there, and Iowa decided to call off the dogs. I honestly thought that they would keep fouling if for no other reason that South Carolina is not a great free throw shooting team and never – That's if there's one facet amongst others that maybe Carolina hasn't been great at, it, it's free throw shooting. Yeah. They, they, they feel and like they're almost great at everything else. And yesterday they were – Particularly poor, 52.9% to to, uh, to Iowa's 80%. Uh, Iowa was 16 of 20, South Carolina 9 of 17. And I thought, hey, at least foul, see if you can get some misses and go down and knock some threes and, and see what happens. I, I was a, So, again, yeah. not necessarily a criticism of Lisa Bluter and, and Iowa, but I did think they might continue that just to see. Yeah, absolutely, and and again, that's kind of what kept Iowa with a mathematical chance in those last couple of minutes when they did foul a little bit that, um, you know, Carolina wasn't able to make those shots when they were able to get to the line, and yeah, I was a little bit surprised for you uh, the same way. Like, yeah, when you get into, like, 
20, 25 seconds to go, sure, that's a little bit too little too late. But, yeah, when you have right around a minute to go, there's certainly more opportunities, especially with the ability that you have, and especially player like Caitlin Clark to knock it down from 33 out where you're not wasting a lot of time. Um, I was surprised to see them kind of call off the dogs a little bit early. Uh, we mentioned Caitlin got hers, but uh, not after the first quarter, really. Cut 12, please, Tyler. Uh, Don Staley in postgame yesterday speaking especially of uh, how hard Raven Johnson worked to uh, guard Caitlin. Um, I mean, I mean, Raven, I mean, for Raven, I think it was psychologically helpful uh, to be able to, to play Iowa and Caitlin to, to just release you know, you, you as a player, you, you want to release certain things that have held you captive. And I do think the waving off in the Final Four last year held her captive to where um, usually you just quietly do things and go about your business. <laughs> Raven's got the bullhorn saying, this is revenge tour, this is this, this is that. And then for her to actually lock in and, 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 and play Caitlin the way we need it, we need her to, to play her. Um, we knew she was going to get her points. We wanted her to get her points in an in a inefficient way. Like, I, I look at the stat sheet, it's beautiful. Like, if she scores, I mean, if she's shooting 50%, we lose a basketball game. So I think it's pretty cool that she was able to just kind of check off a goal and, and move forward, and hopefully there will be another test to challenge her in a way that will continue to elevate her. Caitlin Clark, 10 of 28 from the floor yesterday, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, 5 of 13 from 3, 5 of 6 from the line. Uh, she turned the ball over four times, Tyler, had eight boards. And I say just here, just five assists. Um, she's also, mm -hmm. don't forget, she. I think she averages around nine assists per game. Yeah, she's good about spreading the ball around. Uh, and South Carolina, I think, also was doing a nice job of, of frustrating that part of the equation uh, for Iowa. Because, again, uh, I give a lot of credit to Lisa Bluter through the years for taking advantage of what Caitlin does so well. She might not be the best defender, but her ability to pass the basketball is uh is fantastic so south carolina was able to limit a lot of that yesterday in keeping her in check but again she got her 30 points uh and committed three fouls a couple of them late there and like i said i, I was a little surprised that iowa didn't foul more late in the game but uh i guess at that point coach bluter said you know what we're not overcoming 12 points in 40 something seconds so here we go uh one more on this one uh cut to 16 please tyler dawn staley on this team, uh, which, again, had a couple of new faces, uh, really, what, the three big new faces on this ball club, but just uh, letting them be kids. You, you have to let young people be who they are, but you also have to guide them and, na and help them navigate through this, this tough, tough world. But when, when young people lock in and have a belief and have a trust and their parents have that same trust, this is what can happen. Don Staley in post game yesterday, and I, what I love about that is how honest and forthright she is, while at the same time making what amounts to a recruiting pitch. I mean, this it it, it never stops, and she knows that. You're mentioning parents, there was the story of having to bench Malaysia Full Wiley, uh, and and having a, a hard conversation, not just with Malaysia, but with her mom about some of the things that were going on. And you hear these young women, you heard Camilla Cardoso talking uh, about what Dawn meant to her. And we, we knew that story uh, of, uh, you know, a few weeks back when Dawn was able to get Camilla's mom and sister up from Brazil. They just, they had not seen her play at South Carolina. It's a lot easier said than done, right? Uh, but they were able to do that. But you, you hear Camilla talking about what kind of person Dawn is and, and, and the give and take. And I, you know, I sometimes, as Terry is back in here, um, Terry, you know, one of the things about Dawn that not a lot of other coaches have is the fact that she wasn't just, I mean, all these coaches played, right? Right. Uh, and some of them were good. 
Dawn Staley was amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, I, I have said it, and I, I think it's 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 out there. You know, Dawn Staley was the Magic Johnson of women's basketball. She was a brilliant point guard. She went to multiple Final Fours. Three, I believe, three Final Fours. You know, yeah. she was Player of the Year in college basketball, at least in the ACC for sure, and, and a first team All American. She won three gold medals. You know, think about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, the respect that she had in terms of being that, I, I use the term a lot, but for her, it, it matters, rock star, voted by her peers to carry the American flag at an, at an opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. So it goes, you know, to her, her powers of, of positive persuasion, I would say. She has lived the life of superstar. Wow. Yeah. And, and not everybody can equate that in their own lives when they go, out. look, Gino can go recruit like nobody's business. And Kim Mulkey was on an Olympic team as well. Kim, so, again, I Kim Mulkey could play, yeah. She could. She could. She was great. Uh, Dawn's different. As a player, Dawn's on a whole other level than any of them were. And, and that's who she goes and gets. But she's lived their life. Well, see, it's so rare that you get a former player of that skill and talent who can then become a coach right. at a high level. Right. It's just very, it's very tough because they don't understand the whole roster typically. Right. Because a lot of times you ask a great player, what makes you a great player? I don't know. I'm right. just really good. Yeah. I'm great. Yeah. I was a little kid. Ball kept going in the basket. Right. So when you're a great player, sometimes you just don't get the whole the whole roster, the totality of it all. That's what makes her so special is as great as she was as a coach, and you went over the whole thing, Jay, think about her I mean, you went over as a player. Think about her as a coach yep. and what she's done on such a high level. I'm trying to think of someone to equate that to of who was really good on a high level as a player who then turned into being on a high level I mean, as a coach. I, I think I, I think of Steve Spurrier, who won a Heisman Trophy. But, well, Spurrier and, and, was phenomenal. And, and Steve had a long NFL career, but it was primarily as a backup. No, his college career was special. Yeah, but he won the so, Heisman Trophy, and he coached mm -hmm. the Heisman. So I will go yeah. with Spurrier. Yeah. Um, your Joe Torrey won a Torrey, batting title. Torrey, yeah. Was, uh, people was, forget that. I mean, yep. Dusty Baker was good. He wasn't great. He was good. Uh, Torrey was. Uh, Torrey was really yeah, good. Yeah, Torrey was really good. And uh, Dusty nope. was. Dusty was a. Yeah, he was a good player. He was a very good player. Yeah, he was. He was what I would call in the hall of very good. Yeah. That makes sense. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah. And I'm trying to think of basketball wise. Like, I mean, Lenny Wilkins was a fabulous NBA player. Right, but. And and coached a lot, but was not one ch one title. It was not a great coach. No think, one would ever. I think look Liddy at him. retired with a losing coaching record. Yeah, no one would ever look at him, even though he won a ton of games. You're right, he lost a ton, won a title with the Sonics, but you wouldn't put him up there with Phil and Popovich and Red and all those Pat. guys. No. And Pat Riley was a good player. Pat Riley was good. He wasn't great. He was yeah. he was scrappy. He was That's a, a nice a, way to say it. He was yeah, scrappy. He was a good player. Good player in college. Yeah. Played for Rupp's Runs in right. the '60s. Right. Um. Well, what I'm saying is what Dawn has done, going from a high-level player to a high-level coach, you and I are sitting here at one-hand stuff right, right now of figuring out the people that do that. So that's the air she lives yeah, in. Yeah, absolutely, which is uh, just just makes the job. I guess who just showed up? Yeah, look at that guy. Look at that guy. Hey. So I get a text. I'm going to tell you this real quick before I go to break. So I get a text. Hey, you have a gas can? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jared. What else can go ask? wrong, man? Uh, th this man, in the last week... Please make sure, Terry, before you leave, that the control board is fully grounded. <laughs> Don't want anything loose to, like, give him an electric yeah, All of a sudden you see, like, such. like fire and steam come off his head like Michael that Jackson in that uh, Pepsi commercial. The track lighting is actually <laughs> secure on the ceiling so that nothing falls on Elijah's head. This man has had a week. He has. Just saying. Yeah. Uh, we'll do something nice for him. All right. Uh, a lot to get to uh, on the program. We will get a lot of Elijah's take from Cleveland. Come back on the other side, though. Switch gears. Carolina baseball, another difficult weekend, but uh, they closed it out well enough. And now a big week with North Carolina getting it started tomorrow up in Charlotte. Coach Mark Kingston for his regular Monday visit when the postgame show continues.
Hey, I want to tell you about our great friends at Palmetto Citizens Federal Credit Union. A lot of exciting changes coming for those who are already customers, and if not, some of the great reasons why you could become uh, one of the newest members at Palmetto Citizens. So for one thing, new mortgage servicing experience is coming, uh, more streamlined and modern online and mobile banking system, a lot more streamlined processes just to make things quicker, easier for customers. You can check all of this out at their website, pal uh, at, which is palmettocitizens.org. Again, anything you do with the big banks, checking savings credit cards mortgages car loans student loans they've got all that for you right now great home equity opportunities as well lower rates and fewer fees means you keep more money in your pocket as you and your family grow again for any and all of these services check them out online at palmettocitizens.org or visit any of their 14 midlands locations my wife and i are customers use the millwood branch great people up there whatever you do you'll love what's going on at palmetto citizens federal credit union achieve your potential Welcome back into the postgame show on this Monday afternoon. Jay Phillips and Elijah Campbell with you. That's right. Elijah's back. And we have another harrowing tale for Elijah. My goodness. Oh, boy. This one might take the cake. I don't know how that works, man. I don't know how that works. But uh, good for you. You're back. That's good. And Elijah will sleep well tonight. So there's, there's that. 
Uh, don't forget that uh, you can go to 1075thegame.com, register for the Palmetto Citizens Grand Slam giveaway. Every game, $25 is added to the pot. If a Gamecock hitter hits a Grand Slam home run, you could win all the cash in that pot. And right now, that pot is at more than $800. Again, go to 1075thegame.com. As Ford says, look for the clicky thingy that says that, and then you click it. And away we go. And speaking of Carolina baseball, it's always a pleasure to welcome back on to the program the head coach of the Gamecocks. He is Mark Kingston. Gamecocks uh, drop two of three to A&M, but go to 4-0 in getaway games in conference play. So there is that going for you. Six and six overall. Carolina 22 and 10 on the season. And uh, we'll have North Carolina tomorrow night up in Charlotte. Uh, coach, again, always good to have you. Uh, you did get that one yesterday. Got a little dicey late and uh, I, I don't know, right now, six and six, I know it's not what you want, probably not even what you expected, but where do you see the biggest positives going forward in terms of that 4-0 and mark on Sundays? Well, again, you know, it's, it's a long season, so there's going to be ups and downs. I think in our league this year, it's, it's going to be wild. It's going to be a wild year in our league. You look at the defending national champions, I think they're – two and nine or three and nine right now in, in the conference. So uh, it's going to be a lot of challenges. Uh, we've played what I think is probably the best team in the country this weekend and uh, had a chance to win two out of three. We didn't. We won yesterday. Uh, we found a way to win. We made some adjustments. And uh, it's just going to continue to be a work in progress. Uh, the RPI is still in a great spot. Um, and we just need to keep getting better. There's Mark areas in all, in all oh. facets of our game that I think we can continue to get better. Sorry about that. Cut out for a second. That was my bad. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Coach. Yeah, you mentioned in post game yesterday, too, and in other games this weekend, uh, how good A&M was defensively. So there there is something to be said for how you were defended in terms of opportunities that maybe in a more average sense uh, you, you can take advantage of, yeah? Yeah, I mean, again, that was a really good team, and they have a lot of ways to beat you. They've got a lot of weapons. They've got maybe the uh, one of the top three contenders for National Player of the Year. So uh, we would have had more success uh, even yesterday. Uh, their center fielder made an incredible play on Dalton Reeves' ball to the top of the wall that would have netted us three more runs. But, look, you got to give credit where credit is due. Uh, that was a complete team. But all in all, I think we went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. Uh, outside of the two slow starts for our starting pitchers uh, on Friday and Saturday, and they came out of the games pretty early, uh, this, the last seven innings of Friday were, were neck and neck. The last eight innings on Saturday were neck and neck. And then yesterday we won pretty much from start to finish. So we went toe to toe with what I think is the best team in the country. Uh, we just need to continue to find some areas, uh, and we know what they are. We just need to continue to get better, uh, in some of those areas and we'll continue to make adjustments to try to have the best use of our resources. And, and you mentioned for what it's worth, and I know you don't want to talk about the Florida series, so I won't, other than I'll, I'll just say just to kind of, to, to, to lend credence to what you mentioned about the league, for those who haven't seen the results, Missouri swept Florida this past weekend, and Missouri had not won a conference game, uh, and, and now they, they sweep Florida. So you, you don't know what you're going to get in Southeastern Conference play. But I know that doesn't make a lot of fans uh, happy, Coach. And, and you mentioned the, 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 the starting pitching, so let's go there with all three. Uh, how much of it do you think was scouting, a bad night? And then you had Matthew Becker go yesterday, and he was all right for you uh, with, with eight Ks in four innings as you made that change. What, what might you most attribute the, the starting troubles Friday and Saturday to? Well, you had Eli Jones, who had been – pretty darn consistent all year and had given us really good starts all year. And uh, you combine the fact that at some point, you know, guys just couldn't not get me on top of his game or be at his best. And then you marry that with one of the best offenses in the country. Uh, and on a given night, it just may not be his night. And it wasn't. And I would say about the same for, for Pitzer on uh, Saturday. Now Pitzer is a young guy still develop, trying to develop his third pitch. And, uh, and that third pitch is a change up. And that's how righties generally – keep left-handed hitters off balance. And so sometimes, you know, in, in, in prize fights, they say it all the time, styles make fights. And sometimes it's just not a good matchup for your pitcher versus their hitters or vice versa. And uh, with them being very heavily left-handed in their lineup, it was a tough matchup for Pitzer where against Vanderbilt, they were mostly right-handed and Pitzer could go fastball slider. And it was a great matchup for our side. So 
the game the game is like that a lot of times. You know, the matchups can determine who who has the success, and you just need to continue to evaluate and try to put guys in, in situations where they have their best chance for success. And obviously, with Becker, we know why you and Coach Williams would want to choose a guy like that. Matthew is very good at what he does. He's a veteran guy in this conference. Uh, do you feel like he has locked down the number three role? Or you always tell us that, that you can always be competing, but. Uh, would you like to see some more solidity in, in terms of the rotation, or are you fine with it being a more wide-open competition still? I think it's still a little bit of both. Uh, I, you know, Becker, we've, we've brought along at a pace that I think has gotten him to a very good comfort zone. Uh, he's been pitching great out of the bullpen. Then we gave him a little more length out of the bullpen, and then this weekend we started him, and he's passed every test so far. And there will be some other guys like that, too. You know, you, you may see somebody else make a new start at some point here soon, too, just because – when all is said and done, you, you have a long season, you want to experiment, you want to try things so that when you get down to the end, when you start playing games that are win or go home, uh, you want to make sure you have everything figured out. And so I think most teams in the country right now are still trying to figure things out and we're no different. So uh, you'll still contin continue to see some experimentation, but at some point I would love to be able to just have guys we say, we say we know that's our friday that's our saturday that's our sunday that's our closer that's our setup that's our long reliever that's our left-handed matchup there's there's a million different roles and you're always moving the pieces of the puzzle around to try to try to get that best picture. I would imagine that one of those pitchers that could be vying for uh, an even larger role is Ty Good, who is 4-0. Uh, he has now dipped his ERA under two at 1.93 and has given you better than a strikeout per inning. I, I, he, he's been magnificent and often is called upon, you know, somewhat early, you know, and, and he seems ready to go. Take us more through what you, you like most uh, about Ty and, and how his role could potentially grow. Yeah, you nailed it. You nailed it. Uh, he has been a starter in the past. Um, this year, he's been more a reliever than a starter for us. Um, but we've been trying to get him a little bit more length out of the bullpen. And uh, and we've had some conversations with Ty about why we thought he was good out of the bullpen. And if you want to become a starter, here's what we need to see. Uh, and that's most notably, he needs to hold his velocity better. Um, what we were seeing out of him is for the first 40 pitches of an outing, he would be in that 91, 92 range, and then after that it would fall off to 88, 89. And he's a much better pitcher when he has some more velo, not only for the fastball, for what it does for the off-speed pitches. And so we challenged him a little bit and said, hey, you want to show that you can, you can have a bigger role, uh, hold your velocity longer. And he took that and ran with it. And yesterday on his 82nd pitch, he was 93 miles an hour. So that absolutely opens up the opportunity where you may see him in a starting role because what we asked him to do is hold the velocity longer like a starting pitcher, and he was able to do that. So sometimes when you give guys a, a direct goal and say, hey, if this is what you want, here's how you get it, uh, they live up to it, and Ty did exactly that because he's, he's an elite competitor. He wants to win very badly, and he's got some weapons out there on the mound. Last thing for you, Coach, you've got a big one tomorrow uh, with North Carolina up in Charlotte. This is one that uh, both fan bases always look forward to, uh, but you can only go so far with it in terms of, of how you treat it uh, from a bullpen perspective. So who starts? Do we basically see the same M.O. Uh, from your ball club tomorrow night that we've seen in other midweek games? Yeah, you'll see Dylan SQ starting, uh, and then you'll see Johnny Holstaff after that. Uh, we'll try to use resources that we that we need to try to win the game, but we also can't use them up uh, at the risk of going down to Gainesville this weekend. So it's a it's a balancing act of trying to win that game, but also not not use guys that uh, in a manner that would not allow them to help you win on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a big game. They're all big games at this point. It's North Carolina, then it's Florida, and you've got Arkansas looming, and it's just on and on and on. So we look at every game as a big game these days. How much uh, of the women's game did you get to see? I know you wanted to hustle out of yesterday's post game. Yeah, I was able to see about the I think it was the last eight minutes uh, in the fourth quarter, and so obviously the best part of the game because you get <laughs> to see them pull away and then celebrate. So, much congrats to Dawn and, and her program. Uh, it's as impressive as it gets. You know, it's she's a modern day John Wooden, I think. So it's it's really special to have her here in our athletic department special to have her here in this state so uh, i hope everybody's appreciating everything she does and everything that she's about good luck tomorrow night and this weekend in games we'll talk to you soon appreciate you oh, okay thank you you bet that is gamecock head baseball coach mark kingston all right the trials and tribulations of elijah campbell as the post game show continues
From the WIS Traffic Studios, I'm Elijah Campbell. The few accidents to report to you that are causing some delays on the roadways this afternoon. We're going to start here in Richland County where all the accidents we have are. One on Assembly Street near Calhoun Street is causing things to move pretty slowly through there. We got also one on Highway 1 at Augusta Road near Sparkleberry Lane. And we also have one at Lee Road at Longtown Road. All of these here in Richland County and a couple of blockages here in uh, Richland County as well. There's a long-term road construction on I-26 between Bush River Road and exit 108A and Old Sandy Run Road near exit 125 that is causing some long-term traffic delay. Been talking Carolina women's hoops, 87-75 winners over Iowa. Also talking some Carolina baseball with Coach Mark Kingston. That interview will be up on the podcast page if you missed it. Carolina dropped two of three to A&M this past weekend, uh, losing on Friday 9-2, to two, Saturday 6-3, to three, and hanging on yesterday for a 6-5 win. I think they were up 5-1 uh, to one at one point. And then held on for the 6-5 victory. But as Mark said, and he's, he might not be wrong, A&M might be the uh, the best team in the country uh, at this point. Certainly one of them, they in Arkansas. And and you tell you who else is surprisingly good. They're, they're, they've been a good team in the past. But Kentucky, y'all. Kentucky's 11-1 and in conference play. That's disgusting. I, I just... Not just surprising. That one's disgusting. So uh, there's that. But Kentucky this weekend swept Alabama. There were three sweep, four sweeps. Goodness. Let me see. No, three sweeps in conference play this weekend. Kentucky swept Bama. Um, Arkansas swept Ole Miss. Not a surprise. Missouri sweeping Florida. The is most a unexpected of all. Massive surprise uh, because Missouri's not good. <laughs> They're one of the two teams in the conference that aren't good. Yeah. You got a 14 team league, and two of only two of them are. Missouri bad. and Auburn aren't very good this year. And uh, Tennessee took two of three from Auburn uh, as well. Um, we'll get back into a lot of Carolina basketball talk for you. We do welcome Elijah back from his trip to Cleveland. Uh, I had uh, at least three people ask me today, why didn't Elijah just stay in Cleveland for the eclipse? Uh, and I said, well, primarily because a radio station is having to cover his costs. Exactly. And that would be an extra night. And uh, because of all the stuff that happened in Cleveland, I think you could imagine how hard getting a hotel room would be. And uh, the prices for a lot of rooms were jacked up, to say the least. Yeah. Uh, between the Final Four and the Eclipse, man, especially last night. Wow. So Cleveland is bumping. You've, uh, d did you get to do anything? Not a ton. Um, unfortunately, you know, where I stayed was a little further away. Um, but I, I did take some some casual well, like strolls saying, on like, game day. Like, like Buffalo or Rochester or just greater Cleveland? Uh, North Olmstead, which is about 15 minutes away. Oh, that's not so bad. It's not, it, really, it really isn't bad. Uh, you know, it's about a $10 Uber ride or Lyft okay. ride, you know. So it it, it, it sounds good. very nice. North Olmsted Olmstead sounds very nice. It almost sounds like a gated community. Uh -huh. But it... But. Most certainly was not. I lovely see. town, lovely little town. Uh, there was a Red Lobster near the hotel. There's a Chili's um, and what they call a, a uh, um, Harry Buffalo, which is apparently like a Buffalo Wild Wings knockoff. Okay. So I got to try some craft beers right across walking distance of the uh, hotel. That's good. So on Saturday, after all the media obligations, I get back, do a show from here for about an hour leading into the baseball game, and I walked across and uh, enjoyed a. Uh, some beers and watch the final four yeah the men's final four yeah you mentioned north olmstead uh, not being nice even though it sounds like a nice gated community it always reminds me of uh you know dc suburbs uh, of maryland prince george's county in a town called silver spring and you're like oh that sounds really nice and prince george's county sounds like it would be amazing sounds like royalty uh yeah no. it's not royalty not is so what you're much. saying not so much you're saying it's misleading yeah, a little bit Did prince george didn't live there anymore i guess nah, i think he moved that's unfortunate. He moved out to the further burbs. He lives outside of Annapolis now. Well, Prince the name George. should have followed him, honestly. Sure. Anyway, uh, 8775. Yes. All right. Tell us 
you know, on television, it's hard. On radio, it's hard. There were definitely a lot of people pulling for South Carolina. But if mm-hmm. I, and I am, if I am asking you, Elijah Campbell, who was in the building, the Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse? Yes. Not even Arena anymore. The yeah. artist formerly known as Quicken Loans. Uh, the percentage of people pulling for Iowa related to South Carolina was? I would say about 70-30. Okay. And do you, that, that Flirting was, with 75-25. That was, uh, I mean, the Iowa fans certainly. Were there simply more Iowa fans that got their hands on tickets because of ge- geographic proximity? Or do you think there were more Iowa fans that might have been casual Iowa fans pulling for Caitlin Clark? Like say Jason Sudeikis. Yes, I think there's a lot of a lot of that, a lot of the bandwagoning. Iowa fans apparently do for. Oh, they travel. They man. travel. They travel really yeah. well, and it's I think like, they're, like, got a they're like Carolina. I mean, that's a state that doesn't have a pro team, and I mean, this is their yeah yeah yeah, yeah. No, exactly yeah. And there were a lot of South Carolina fans, but you know, walking around the place, there was just so much Iowa. I mean, like I was t- telling you that you know the plane that I took from Chicago to Cleveland, full of Iowa fans, right? A whole lot of Iowa black and gold. They they flooded the place, and during that 10-0 run to start the game, buddy, it got loud in there. It felt like a home game during that three-minute stretch where it got to 10 to nothing, and when it you know the lead ballooned to 20 to nine, yep. you could really feel that Iowa ha- Iowa had the building for that part of the game. Um, yeah, I, I sometimes joke maybe people in Iowa, unlike South Carolina, just uh, sometimes want to get out of Iowa when they can. No, I'm kidding, Iowa people. I'm kidding. As far as you know, um, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. It's it's one of those things where again, the Caitlin Clark effect and phenomena has been tremendous. How women's basketball uh, uses that as a springboard is, is going to be very interesting because I think they can, and I think there are a, a, a lot of young women out there right now that can can be superstars. Now, do they have the same abilities that Caitlin has? You know. We'll see. Um, she, she seems very generational in, in terms of just, just an amazing talent. And, again, yesterday Carolina did a great job. 10 of 28 is what she shot from the floor. Um, and Dawn said she was looking at it and felt like that was beautiful in, in terms of what they had her do. 5 of 13 from 3. She made five of, 5 of 6 of her free throws. So she about hit her season average on points, um, had 5 assists. I think she averages closer to 9 a game, if I'm not mistaken. I'll double-check that for you. But um, and eight boards for Caitlin Clark. So and she played, of course, all 40 minutes. Three Iowa players played all 40 minutes. Uh, Raven Johnson led South Carolina. And this is rare. South Carolina had two starters go above 30 minutes. That does not happen very often. Raven played 37. Camilla played 31. Uh, Ashlyn Watkins did not have as big a role yesterday. Often, you know, Ashlyn comes in and will play. Uh, above 20 minutes Chloe Kitts did start but only played 17 but in those 17 minutes 11 points 10 boards two assists Uh, she had a great game yesterday in in a limited opportunity and again Tessa Johnson leading the way off the bench 25 minutes played 19 points 7 of 11 from the floor three of her six three-pointers made both her free throws uh, had an assist and four rebounds and a steal as well so a tremendous all-around game from tessa johnson and you you really got to like what tessa and malaysia full wiley are going to look like next year i uh, mentioned this earlier south carolina for whatever it's worth to you uh has already opened as the 2025 betting favorite at plus 250 i might take that plus 250 oh that plus two like plus 250 for a one like game thing isn't a lot a futures bet that's plus 250 is insane yeah and Insa- like that is insanely low odds to make a bet on something almost 365 days before you'll know if it comes true, and it's only at plus, what do say, 260? 250. 250, 50. Man, that, is, that's, that just goes to show. I wonder what the odds would be specifically if they lose another game. Somebody will, somebody will do that for you. Somebody probably has, somebody probably would have those odds. Well, somebody does. This, By the way, I mentioned this earlier with Tyler. Uh, yesterday's game was the uh, and this final four but yesterday's game to the most bet on women's college basketball game ever uh 20 more bets than friday's game FanDuel uh that was wow. espn bet FanDuel took 22 percent more uh caesar said they took double the previous record handle again handle <laughs> is the uh, total amount of money wagered on both teams in any given game um uh, 
and that uh, the South Point Casino in Vegas says that the games uh, were similar to a well-bet college football game, a wow. well-bet college football game. That's remarkable. Yeah. Well, that's, an, that's another sign of growth. I mean, not t- like TV ratings sign of growth, but that is a sign of growth. And uh, again, speaking of TV, we are awaiting those final numbers. But the early word from Richard Deitch of The Athletic is that this will be the most viewed women's basketball game of all time. ESPN will have their numbers out in just a little bit. We've got another big college basketball story brewing. We'll have that for you as the postgame show continues. All right, welcome back in. I told Elijah I'd do this, so if you're watching on YouTube, I am uh, putting on my Eclipse glasses. Uh, thank you to Terry Ford for giving me a spare pair. I know I have a pair 
at our house from the 2017 eclipse that we got here. You know, we had the total eclipse in Columbia. Couldn't, uh, I don't know where they are. Couldn't find them anywhere. Haven't had these in a long time. Spent too much time. Well, I should have done it this weekend, and I didn't. Uh, but I enjoyed it and uh, went out and shared uh, these with a few people here in our in our building. I just went during the last commercial break. It's it's gone. Uh, it's just a regular old boring round sun again. Boo. Yeah, but these things work. I can't see squat in front of me right now. Uh, they I, I looked. My fingers am holding up. <laughs> I, I do. You could be flipping me off right now, and I'd be like, I don't know, eight. You know, so. <laughs> Uh, Close. Just, uh, yeah, I'm going to take these off, though. That's going to get disconcerting after a while. But uh, for those of you, I saw one guy out here, man, like trying. <laughs> he had his sunglasses on, right? And he's taking, y'all just imagine, he's taking his hand, all right? <laughs> like, you know, when you want to make like the dog shadow puppet thing or shadow, ball, you know? And, uh, and and he and he was just trying to like do it. And I was like, dude. That's not how it works. It, you're, you're still going to get blinded. If you try to look at the sun through your sunglasses and a, and, a, and a little sliver between your fingers. I was like, please don't do that. The fingers don't minimize the sun's power. Uh, please, yeah, please don't, you know. And, and so uh, the sun is very bright. The sun's uh, very good at what it does. It is very, it's excellent, actually. It's a, a fine ball of fusion, man. It is. Gives off a ton of light. And uh, it does I not care about your hand. You know, I remember from the last time, not that I, listen, we've all known, like, don't look at the sun. And your body does try to quickly react for you. Uh, a sense of danger. Yes, it knows, right? But I did remember this. There, there are not pain receptors in your eye, at the back of your eyes. And so you could do it, right? And, like, it's not going to know that it hurts you, per se, if you force yourself to do it. Which, again, people are doing if they try to use sunglasses to look at an eclipse but these things are Hand i mean does nothing they're, they're they're pretty cool though but we got uh we got about 75 percent. and during our first commercial break uh in the three o'clock hour is when it was at its best here and it was still pretty bright even though about 75 percent of the sun was covered sun's pretty good at what it does yes yeah, yeah, so I, 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 I told i told our it's security good. guy i was like you know sun is really really good at what it does the sun's been doing this for a long time it's old and it has a long way to go. And unlike Tom Brady, I hope it never retires. There you go. I hope it keeps its prime One day, for a man. long time. One day. One day it's going to. Is Schefter going to break that news, too? <laughs> His great, 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 grandsons, great, 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 grandsons. You get it. Breaking news. Sources say son is planning to retire. Speaking of breaking news, last night the college basketball world turned on its head, and this doesn't happen very often, but John Calipari uh, deciding on his own to go ahead and get out of Lexington, Kentucky, and head down to Fayetteville, Arkansas, to be the new head coach of the Razorbacks. The reason that this surprised me so much, relative to a lot of things now where I don't get too surprised, especially for as long as I've been doing this, is that... You know, first off, Mitch Barnhart, the AD at Kentucky, had come out with a statement a couple of weeks ago. You know, I sat down with John, and I'm paraphrasing it, of course, but I, we, we sat down and talked, and John's going to be back next year, and, and we're all good and ready to go. Um, another reason it surprised me is because Arkansas's Hunter Juracek, who's good at what he does, had already interviewed and presumably been turned down by both Chris Beard of Ole Miss and Jerome Tang of Kansas State. And when you're swinging for the Ole Miss and Kansas State coach and you don't get them, not that they couldn't go get somebody, but your your mind isn't going to take you as the third choice to John Calipari of Kentucky or really honestly to any sitting Kentucky basketball coach. Now, that said, there's precedent for something like this because Tubby burned out, if you will. And decided to go to Minnesota, where he the, saw the writing on the wall. The pressure was about you know seventy percent less. Uh, he made a lot of money, and and maybe Cal did the same thing here. Like you know what, mm-hmm. to heck with it. I'm gonna continue to get paid because he was gonna make them fire him, and firing him would have meant he would have been paid thirty three million dollars, and and then he could still coach. I'm pretty sure there were no uh, there's no mm-hmm. mitigation. So he, he like would have gone and gotten another job. And uh, so this now allows him to get out of that pressure cooker where it has not gone as well as it is supposed to or should, you could even say. Uh, and now who does Kentucky go get next? Uh, I want to. 
I, I have some thoughts. And, and during our news segment, we're going to – I got I got one that I think would be the guy. I really – and I'm and I'm very serious. So I'll have that for you coming up in a Ooh, few. I'm but how did, how did you react last night? Were you as surprised as I was in a lot of people? When I first saw the rumblings, because obviously a lot of this broke on Twitter, right? So you're seeing this, and it was a TV reporter in Fayetteville that was doing a really good job of of breaking. I think the, I think the guy's name was Wes Moore, um, who was saying, you know, this should be could be final by tonight. And a lot of people were like, you know, this is no, this is just speculation. It's rumor, all this type of stuff. And at first, I was like, there's no way Cal would leave. And then I thought, wait a minute. I mean. If he cares about the university, this is the cleanest split you can have. If he can get a raise at Arkansas, so he's not leaving for money, he's going to a place where the expectations are going to be a little different. He'll have a little more leeway. He'll go to a place he's wanted. John Calipari, you know, he might not sound like he wants to be liked, but he liked coaches like to be liked by their fan base, and the fan base does not like John Calipari right now. Right. And I think he felt unwanted, and that's why he was able to bounce. So the idea of him leaving, honestly, isn't too surprising. The biggest surprise is that the man stayed somewhere for more than 15 years. Right. And maybe maybe it is just time. You use the Steve Spurrier analogy all the time about, you know, maybe 10 years at a place is is good. I think Calipari hit that hit that point. Not, you know, if he got to do it to move to Arkansas where they're willing to spend a lot of, you know, frozen chicken money to help him get good players, then he's in a place where he'll be able to succeed. Yeah. And he'll get he'll get the talent. You know, he's 65 years old, so this is going to be it. I think he could take him into his early 70s and and probably ride it out from that point. It'll be interesting. News of the day. More on Dawn Staley's championship coming up for you.
From the WIS Traffic Studios, I'm Elijah Campbell. The few accidents to report to you that are causing some delays on the roadways here in the Midlands. We'll start in the Irmo Chapin area. An accident has been reported in I-26 eastbound just after the Broad River Road exit, exit 97. So that's causing some mild traffic back up in northeast Columbia. On Lake Carolina Boulevard at Hard Scrabble Road, an accident's causing some traffic trouble. And lastly, we have one in Columbia on Lee Road at Longtown Road. And, of course, we start with the Women's Basketball National Championship. Congratulations to Dawn Staley's Gamecocks for Coach Dawn, her third title in Columbia. She becomes just the third women's basketball coach to have three or more titles, joining Pat Summit, Gina Oriema, Tara Vanderveer, and Kim Mulkey. South Carolina becomes the 10th school to go undefeated and win a national title. By the way, five schools have done it. Connecticut has done it six times. Six times. Six times they went undefeated. Stupid. <sighs> wow. Just stupid amounts of, of winning. South Carolina down 10 nothing to start the ball game. Found themselves down 11 points on a couple of occasions beyond that in the first quarter. Down seven at the break. But after that, uh, began to really ramp up the defensive pressure. Uh, outscored Iowa by 10 in the second quarter, by six in the third quarter, by three in the fourth on their way to that 12-point victory, 38-0. and 0. So, uh, Iowa shot 39.2% from the floor yesterday. Caitlin Clark got hers, uh, but at times it was ugly. She scored 30 points. Remember, 18 of those 30 points came in the first quarter. Beyond that, South Carolina really locked down. She had three points, I believe, in the second quarter. And did she have any in the third? Can't remember for sure. I have the full the full paper box score actually. Um, but uh, you know, just Raven Johnson, especially defending her. Others did as well, but Raven was uh, I thought brilliant. Um, uh, Caitlin was also five of thirteen from three yesterday. Uh, she did have uh, five assists, but I think she typically has more than that because she led the nation in assists uh, in, and scoring. Four points in the third quarter. Four in the third. Okay. So a very inefficient four points, four okay. points on seven shots. Yeah. Well, I, I, you were there and, and what I saw, and again, I don't mean this to be critical. I just, this is, this is observational. Uh, listen, she's a brilliant, brilliant talent. There is zero doubt of that. And I think she can only get better. Um, but I think she's one of those competitors because I've, I've watched several of her games um, and rarely are they down, but when they are, she seems like the kind of competitor that wants to take what I was jo joking with Terry earlier, a 10 point shot. Yeah. You know, and I see it sometimes in, in quarterbacks in football, they want to throw a 21 point touchdown. And I'm like, dude, it only counts as six, no matter how hard yep. you're trying, no matter how hard you want to thread that needle. And I think the same of her, I know she can hit those, those 25 plus threes. I know it, but when you're taking too many or you're rushing it, you know, you're only still going to get three and can you be more patient in the offense? And perhaps it was because Carolina, you and I talked about this a lot last week, denying some of those passing lanes. Mm -hmm. Do not let her pass the ball when she feels like she can. She made a few nice ones. That play Malaysia made, by the way, that talk about effort. Yeah. Um, but I, I do. I, I think I think Caitlin Clark is probably the type of competitor. And this is again, I, I, I don't mean this in any way critically, because there's a lot of people out there. I, we all have friends that are like this. They they hate losing more than they like winning. And I think she's one of those players. But at times, like I've got to go do something. Mm -hmm. And like you said, inefficient. That's what Carolina wanted to do: make her frustrated and want to hit what I kept calling the ten point shot. <laughs> 
Yeah, and that that one about 25-footer that she threw up towards the end of the game when there was still a little bit of a chance. I think it might have been a seven-point game. I say that went from nine to six is what I want to say, but yeah, somewhere in that range. Yeah, It could have gotten it down to, you know, two big possessions. Yeah. And they settled for a very tough, contested, tired jump shot. Right. And you could tell the legs weren't there on it. And I think at that point was when Iowa knew this wasn't happening. Well, I was surprised, and I want to know what the the feeling in the building was like. I told Tyler this earlier, Elijah. Um, you know, with 50 seconds to go, give or take, and obviously Carolina up 12, Lisa Bluter decided to stop. And South Carolina is not a great free throw shooting team. If they have a flaw, that's where it is. More than any other partic- particular facet of the game, they're, they're okay at, at free throws. They're not great. And yesterday they weren't very good. Barely 50, 17. Yeah, barely 50% <laughs> yesterday. Um if I'm Iowa, I'm, I'm going to make Carolina get to the line, and I'm going to do all I can. If they go one of two, O oh of two, and if they go two of two, so be it. I'm still going to go down and have my megastar try to knock down threes and, and at least get, give me three for one on a couple of, of, of trips and just see what mm-hmm. happens. So I was – that was probably the most surprising part of that. And, I, again, I realize that's still a tall mountain to climb, but I think it's a mountain worth attempting to climb – because you yeah. don't have another shot at it. Well, that's the thing. The The plan for Iowa, even though I thought offensively they ran a lot of really good stuff, they run a lot of awesome off-ball action to get their players open because you know what they're going to do. Caitlin Clark's going to have the ball, and she's going to either drive, kick, or shoot You know, a Steph Curry-like shot. But there were still a couple of off-ball actions that were able to get Iowa cutters closer to the basket, and they were developing you know, really good looks. And But once South Carolina made a couple adjustments defensively, especially one on Caitlin Clark that I think really changed the game in terms of how they took away her left hand. She's right-handed, but her best three-point shooting move is to her left, and they were giving her right-handed drives because they would rather her drive and funnel them into the shot blockers than kick out or do that sidestep fadeaway three that she seemingly is automatic at when she's in her best rhythm. Uh, they they took that out of the game, and when they were able to take that out, South Carolina didn't have a or not South Carolina Iowa didn't have a counterpunch. My right. biggest critique of Bluter in that game as a coach was I didn't know of much of a counterpunch offensively. Defen- uh, defensively, they ran a two three. They went one three one. They kind of just did a lot of incognito defenses for a few possessions in the second half. But offensively, once that counterpunch was ta- or that punch was taken away, they had no counter, and I think that really hurt them a lot. Because I think at that point. South Carolina and Dawn and, and all of them, they realize that they've got this, you know, right where I want it. Uh, a little ironic if you consider last season's game where South Carolina maybe didn't have that yep. counterpunch when when some of what they did best was taken away against Iowa in the Final Four. Uh, two big numbers that stood out to me, at least two big statistics that stood out to me here and, and to everybody else, the rebounding edge, South Carolina 51-29. to 29. Mm-hmm. You heard me right, 51-29 to 29 in rebounding. And again, the bench play, which we knew was spectacular, uh, showed it once again. South Carolina, 37 points off the bench, including Carolina's leading scorer, Tessa Johnson, with 19 points. Iowa's bench, zero. Zero. Just uh, a remarkable performance for Coach Dawn's mm-hmm. team. Cut eight here, Elijah. This is Dawn Staley on the significance of this, her program's third national title. Well, uh, it, it means that we have quietly have done things, in my opinion, the right way. You know, we find the right pieces to help us. We, we, we really do things the right way. We're very disciplined in how we approach basketball. I am one that I'm forever indebted to basketball. So I'm, I'm always going to take care of it. I'm always going to make sure that our players are respectful. I'm always going to make sure that um, they know the history of our game. Um, I want to make sure they are always respectful to our opponents. And when you do it that way, um, in return, you have success. You have success in the wins column and very little, you know, disappointment in, in the loss column. Um, and I don't, I, I don't think that's talked about enough, what we've been able to do, and I don't know why. And I really don't care why. We're going to keep doing what we're doing the right way. You know, whether we are the uh, popular or unpopular um, successful programs in the country. So we're going to keep doing that that way. 
Good stuff from Coach Dawn. Uh, and she's right. And now, Elijah, yeah, look, she'll take it as a challenge, I'm sure. And, and the players that, that are with her now and the ones they will recruit in the future, how can South Carolina become what Tennessee and Connecticut were? Uh, and again, I, I say this only from the era in which it happened, you know, when, when, because Pat Summit is amazing. But when Pat was doing it, there wasn't a lot of competition around her program. And she was able to really just get the best players and just utterly dominate. And then we talked about it. Gino has six undefeated teams that won a national title. Uh, so he was able to do it in an era when there was a little more buzz and popularity and, dare I say, even a little bit of parody. But you look at what Dawn is doing now, and you look at what Caitlin Clark has just done, and you look at a name like Juju Watkins out on the West Coast, and I could go on and on, what Angel Reese has done. There is more parity now. Schools are going to start to spend more money on this sport because there's going to be something in it for them. And can Dawn begin to, you know, and, and how is it measured? Well, you weren't Pat. Well, you weren't Gino. I, I, that now becomes one of the stories mm -hmm. around this program because they will go into next year as the number one team in the country. There's zero doubt of that. I don't even know who number two is going to be. I don't really care. Probably Connecticut. But South Probably. Carolina is so bleeping loaded with talent for next season, man. It's frightening how good they can be again. And then you say to yourself, well, can you be better than undefeated national champion? No, but you can go do it again. Yeah, and I don't think that's completely out of the realm of possibility. I mean, look, they're bringing in the number one high school player in the country, the Gatorade High School Player of the Year in Joyce Edwards, and then they're bringing in another McDonald's All-American. They're bringing in a player who didn't play or didn't play this year. She reclassified right. um, and basically, you know, it was, it was nursing an injury yeah. but uh, in a, at Hill Tech and – Look, you might even get a player in the transfer portal, maybe. But then I'm I'm looking at the roster right now, trying to find. I just playing the numbers game, right? Like you're losing Camilla, sakima has gone, so that is one, two, three, four, like what nine spots mm -hmm. uh, that are already coming back, mm -hmm. and then you're adding two. Mm -hmm. Even if you add another spot, I don't know how. Like managing minutes is going to be the hardest thing, right? Like this is such an embarrassment of riches that Don's biggest obstacle next year is figuring out who to put on the floor. <laughs> and, and how many minutes and, and divvying them up. And, you know, I know she's not worried about keeping players happy because I think they've developed a culture where it's not about the minute accumulation. Right. I think it's at this point, it's, hey, what can I, what type of lineups can I throw out there? What type of looks can I give people? And I mean, it, that's going to take a while to figure out just because you have so many good players at different positions. They could easily uh, do it again. And, it, and it, we'll have a they lot more from Dawn um, and a little bit from Caitlin Clark, too. Plus, I want to get to y'all's phone calls on the other side after the uh, the integrated media headlines of the day. So we'll come back around to that again. Carolina 87-75 to go 38-0 and on the season and clinch the national championship. Again, the other big basketball story of the weekend happened last night, and it's not about the men's Final Four, which, by the way, they do have that championship game tonight. Oh, yeah, and it's two number one seeds. And, oh, yeah, Connecticut is going for its own brand of men's basketball history and trying to become a back-to-back -back champion for the first time since Florida's Billy Donovan did it in 06, in 05, 06, 06, 07, 06, 07, 06, 07. 06, 07. Um, and speaking of Billy Donovan, that gets me into this story. If you have not heard yet, John Calipari last night shocked the basketball world by mm -hmm. agreeing to a five-year deal with Arkansas. He'll be making eight and a half a year plus incentives uh, over in Fayetteville. That opens the Kentucky job. Uh, and Billy Donovan, by the way, is not the guy that I'm going to say because if I'm Billy Donovan, I'm not coming back to college basketball now. I've been in the NBA a long time, and a lot has changed. And I've already mm -hmm. turned Kentucky down twice. I'll tell you who I think Kentucky needs to go get right now. And it's not the guy in the state of Alabama that just went to the Final Four. Hmm. They need to go get Bruce Pearl. Interesting. They need to go get Bruce Pearl. And he would thrive in that job. I have said before, Bruce Pearl, there are three facets of his coaching job. Number one, he's a terrific basketball coach. Mm -hmm. Number two, Good he's fit. a terrific recruiter. Number three, he is a terrific marketer. P.T. Barnum, I call him. And right now, Salesman. Kentucky could use a lot of that. He's energetic. He and you know, and he's sixty. He's like he's he's Cal's age. They're both in their mid sixties. Bruce Pearl would be phenomenal. I I really believe he is built 
for that. I know he hasn't had some of the postseason success of late, and they certainly this year crapped the bed. But he's been to a Final Four since John Calipari's been. And and while That's he true. doesn't necessarily recruit the same type of talent, he recruits at a relatively high level for Auburn. And he did at Tennessee, which, too. I, I, I'm telling you, there are still about 30% of Auburn fans that don't even know they play basketball. So unfortunate, given how good that team was this year. So wouldn't that be the weirdest SEC basketball coaching character arc to start at Tennessee, get in trouble, then right. go to Auburn, and then get promoted by, you know, basically to go to Kentucky? And be I wouldn't look coach. anywhere else, man. Yeah, I like so Nate weird. Oates a lot. I like Billy Donovan. There's other names. But Mitch Barnhart, dude, you should get Bruce Pearl out of Auburn today. Announce mm. it tonight at halftime. That's the Integrated Media headlines of the day brought to you by Integrated Media. For all your home theater needs, home security, and so much more. Plus, we're going to be out at their uh, Pro Swing location in Chapin tomorrow. Yes, I'm so excited. That'll be fun. Playing some golf. My good friends at Integrated Media, 803-948-8327. More on Carolina's championship coming up. Uh, guess what, kids? Air conditioning season's coming up, and it lasts until, you know, like Thanksgiving around here. Beat the seasons with AAA heating and air. Is it, is it time for a system upgrade? Would you like something that you know you can count on that's going to be more efficient and in the long run save you some money? Well, get a free replacement estimate today. How, you ask? You go to call AAA today.com. That's call AAA today.com. Let AAA heating and air uh, get some of their great techs in, put you in a brand new system. You'll get no payments or interest for a year. And Roy and Dana Finley give you their magnificent 15 year parts and labor guarantee on that new system. I love what they've done at my house. I promise you, you will as well. Whether it's call AAA today.com or on the phone, 803 677 1500, you and your family can stay comfortable all year long with AAA heating and air. Tell them Jay Phillips sent you. It's AAA, heating and air.
Hawkeyes can work for the final shot to take the lead into the locker room. But Raven Johnson steals it from Caitlin Clark. She will drive the length of the floor and lay it up and in. And the Gamecocks lead 49-46. Here's Stokey across midcourt to Caitlin Clark. Feeds it out left side. They're not going to get a shot off. The Gamecocks rally from an 11-point deficit and will take a three-point lead into the locker room here in the national championship. A microcosm moment of Raven Johnson's defense on Caitlin Clark, a, a, a spot where Iowa could have held a shot and taken a halftime lead. Uh, I'm not saying that that alone shifted all the momentum, but uh, a one-point Gamecock lead, again, could have been a deficit. You almost feel like it probably would have been, that, that Iowa is going to score there and instead pick the pocket, take that time away from uh, Iowa's ability to run their offense, and South Carolina goes into the locker room with a three-point halftime lead on their way to a 12-point victory over Iowa. All right, uh, welcome back in. Jay Phillips, Elijah Campbell with you. Uh, the numbers are in on viewership, and I want you to, to, to sit down and listen to this for just a second here. 18.7 million viewers on average through the course of the game with a peak of 24 million people watching. It is the most watched women's basketball game ever. It is the most watched basketball game, men's, women's, college, or NBA in five years, not even an NBA Finals game has done more business than this game yesterday in the last five years. It is also, excluding football or Olympic coverage, the most watched sporting event period in the United States since 2019. 24 million peak. That's better than some college football mm -hmm. playoff championship games. That's remarkable. It is up 89% from last year, which, by the way, Iowa LSU at the time was the most watched women's basketball game ever. Just a year ago, 89% more viewers and 285% better than the ones that watched Carolina win in 22. 285% in two years. Uh, I, I, I figured it would be good. But when you're throwing in things like most watched basketball game at any level in this nation in five years. A lot of good basketball has been played in this country. Uh, that's, that's absolutely remarkable. Now, look. It, you know, you had a generational talent in the game that people wanted to see do something, uh, either win or lose. Again, a lot of people cheer for her. A lot of people cheer against her that are neutrals. Um, Carolina has a lot of fans. Don Staley has a lot of fans. But the Caitlin Clark effect was, was on full display this weekend. There's no doubt of that. Um, but this is remarkable. This is absolutely remarkable in terms of what they were able to do. Wow, a peak of 24 million. I'm I, trying to think of a, a word, trying to dig into the mental thesaurus here to, to find a word to describe that, and I got nothing. Uh, you know, we knew this would probably break the record that, what, Iowa and UConn just set? Friday night. Friday night. And, and, it, I, and it that LSU it. and Iowa had set on Monday night. It's doing the thing where it's just each big game is breaking its own record. And you know what? The best part about this thing is now, too, like when you look at the Elite Eight ratings from all the Elite Eight games, one of the least watched ones, I guess, and, and it still had a really good viewership that peaked pretty well, was still South Carolina, Oregon State. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people, twenty, at least 24 million people at one point in the game, and, at that game watched. And I guarantee you millions of people fell in love with Tessa Johnson. Yeah. They who've never seen her play before, or Malaysia Full Wiley. Well, let's face it, who've that never game seen was her play before. Easter Sunday afternoon. I mean, yeah, you know, a lot of people having that family dinner and such. Exactly. It, it was it, it was an inconvenient time frame, and a lot of the big the big viewership games have involved like you know, have been have involved Iowa because of the Caitlin Clark effect. Yeah. I think you're going to see a very similar effect whenever Malaysia Full Wiley becomes one of the faces of the sport. I think so. 
And I really do. Her I, and Juju Watkins as sophomores. Yeah. And, and, and you got Malaysia, who is a firebrand, and you got Tessa, who's sort of the quiet assassin at Carolina. Three-point sniper. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, and fun aesthetically to watch play, right. too. Um, like, there's, there's so much brandability of the South Carolina team that just didn't get to be – Exploited. I feel like that's because there was a lot of national media fixation on Caitlin Clark, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of national media fixation on LSU based off of Kim Mulkey and what happened last year. Right. It, this might have been the quietest undefeated championship season ever, ever, in terms of the popularity of the sport had other names that were probably discussed more on a daily basis than South Carolina. I'm not saying, like, South Carolina, no one watched or anything like that. That's not true. And obviously, they're the biggest brand in the sport right now. But there was a somewhat quietness about them. And I think after Sunday, that's never going to be the case again. I don't think so. Ever again. Ever, 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 <laughs> ever. But again, ever. Uh, congrats to both teams. Uh, the most watched basketball game or non-football Olympic sporting event in this country in the last five years. That is remarkable. Uh, Thomas wants to weigh in on what we're talking about. Hey, Thomas, good afternoon. Hey, good afternoon, guys. Um, y'all was wondering why she, uh, our coach didn't call, uh, uh, didn't have a g- girls do the foul game. Right. If you looked at them, they was tired. You know, coaches get in a uh, press conference and get lip service. Yeah. But when she said her girls was tired, they were tired. Mm-hmm. Because Caitlin Clark having to run around, run off screens, trying to get open, but our girls were right there in her jersey. It was one of them deals. If she go to the bathroom, they went with her. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great point, Thomas. And just to back you up, man, uh, yeah, three Iowa starters played the entire game. Uh, another played 35 minutes. Uh, Stolke played 27 minutes. Uh, O'Grady off the bench played just 13. She averages only over eight. Yeah. This year uh, Firebalk played five minutes off the bench, and then they had some some girls obviously come in at, at the end of it. But you're right, Thomas, uh, and it could well be that Lisa Bluter, as we said, you know, simply knew that we weren't going to uh, we weren't going to climb, as I mentioned earlier, climb that mountain, and and maybe she just saw the writing on the wall. You, you're you're probably onto it there. Yeah, and uh, and one thing else, I'm gonna let y'all go. I hope that they held a spot open on our Olympic team to let Caitlin come in because that's just going to uplift their sport even more. I agree. You uh, know what I mean? Yeah, th- thanks, Thomas, for the phone call. Good stuff, buddy. Um, I-, I agree. I- and I don't know the particulars. I know, you know, if they hadn't have made the Final Four, like she was going to get to go to the to the camp. Um, listen, there can be exceptions to lots of rules and the waving of magic wands. Uh, the United States women's basketball team, just like the United States men's basketball team, is going to be loaded with superstars. Uh, Elijah and I have talked about this a bunch. You know, the only thing that makes news for the United States basketball programs are if they do not bring home Olympic gold. Uh, and everybody on the planet knows that. I, 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 so I really, when I say this, now, I, I don't think, like, come on, Jay, are you serious? Like, could Caitlin Clark be on this team and play a meaningful role? Certainly. Sure. That she has not yet played professional basketball and been around some of these, you know, women that are professionals, that are more grown, more are, are more experienced, um, is certainly something that makes a difference. Now, do you just bring her in like, you know, Christian Leitner was on the Dream Team? Yeah, I would. As the honorary 12th yeah. player and, that's a college player. Yeah, and then and – then, and just let her get into camp and see what happens. But remember, it's during her rookie season of the WNBA. Uh, there, there could be a lot of other factors that play into this. So, again, I'm not doubting her ability to become a regular rotational part of American women's basketball for the next mm-hmm. decade plus. But it is something to think about in terms of the other things that are there. Plus, again, she plays every minute of every game. She may not need to go do that right now. Oh. I don't know. I, you know, I don't, I don't know. She's going to get drafted a week from today. Right. The draft is a week from today. The right. season just ended, and the draft is in seven days. So. I, that's, I, that's why I'm surprised she even put her name in the ring to be, be there to begin yeah. with. But. Well, we'll see how that one goes. Thomas, thank you. Drive around the SEC. More on John Calipari's departure from Kentucky. You're listening to the Post Game Show.
From the WIS Traffic Studios, I'm Elijah Campbell with a few accidents to report to you that are causing some delays on the roadways here in the Midlands. We'll start in Richland County. Accident on Arrow Road Lane at Bush River Road is causing some traffic back up. That one's recently been reported. Another one in the Irmo Chapin area on I-26 eastbound after the Broad River Road exit, exit 97. That one's caused some traffic delay for about the last 30 minutes. Got another one on Lake Carolina Boulevard at Hard Scrabble Road. That one has been an issue here for about an hour now. And then another one in Columbia on Lee Road at Longtown Road. The good news is that we do have an accident cleared. That's in Lexington County on I-26 westbound at I-126 near exit 108A. And it is drive around the SEC time. Again, spending a lot of time today talking about South Carolina women's basketball's national title, 87-75 over Iowa. Uh, the Hawkeyes shooting just 39.7% uh, after a red-hot start to the ball game. Caitlin Clark scored 30 total points. 18 of them, though, came in that first quarter. South Carolina, especially Raven Johnson, did a magnificent uh, job in uh, defending the, the nation's best player, uh, Camilla Cardoso, was named the MOP of the tournament. Congratulations to her as she heads off to, like Caitlin Clark, be a lottery pick in the WNBA draft. Uh, she, Camilla, and Chloe Kitts with double doubles yesterday. So uh, tremendous. And again, uh, some of the numbers, the two that stand out to me more than any others, uh, rebounding. The edge to South Carolina, and it wasn't just an edge, kids. 51 to 29 bench points, South Carolina 37, Iowa 0. You know, a real fun stat from the first half. You want to talk about tired legs going into the second? I tallied it up. Iowa had nine bench minutes in the first half. Mm. South Carolina's bench accounted for 38 minutes of game time. And again, Tessa Johnson leading the Gamecocks uh, in scoring yesterday with 19 points off the bench. That's the fun part. My, my favorite thing about this team is the amount of times you do get a different leading score. Now, Camilla was the leading score most of the games this year, but there was a good amount of, I guess, differences. One game it would be Camilla being the leading scorer. One game it's Powell. One game it's Malaysia. And then you have the random Tessa Johnson three-point shooting outburst. Right. And, you just so happen to get that in a national title game. Right. And sometimes Chloe Kitts would yeah, be Chloe the leading Kitts scorer at halftime. Times, right. Like you had so many players on this team that could lead the uh, lead the team in scoring, which means like they're beating teams in a variety of different ways. And it doesn't rely on one player to be able to do so. I mean, Camilla ended up being, you know, finishing the season as the leading scorer in terms of just, you know, uh, points per game. But she didn't play for a stretch this year. And they won all games pretty handily, including one against a Final Four team here at CLA on Super Bowl Sunday. That's just that is a, a fun, fun look at this this group. Uh, the other big story in the SEC last night: John Calipari, longtime head coach at Kentucky, and of course, uh, Final Fours. Well, technically, Final Fours at Memphis and Massachusetts as well uh, is leaving UK to become the head coach at Arkansas. Uh, he has signed, or will, I don't know if he's signed it yet, but it's uh, an eight, or excuse me, a five-year deal, eight and a half per year, plus incentives. Uh, he'll still recruit at a high level. He will not have some of the just, I don't know, immense pressure, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say on him. The microscope isn't but, going yeah, to be as intense. It, it will, But it will be strong, and, and there will be expectations. Cer certainly when you pay someone that kind of money, it's not like you're coming in, you know, hey, hey yeah, sure, John, go play some golf. You know, it's not going to be a retirement tour. Um, and remember, Eric Musselman did a fantastic job. This past season, no, but in the three seasons prior, uh, it included a trip to the Sweet 16 and two Elite Eights. 
So, you know, and it's Arkansas. They they do mm-hmm. they they care very much about their basketball. And while this current generation wasn't alive when 40 minutes of hell was a thing under Nolan, I remember that's a team that played for back-to-back titles and won one of them. And they were fun to watch, man. Now, the, the different brand of basketball. You don't you don't see that type of full court uh, they pressure. Were, they were anymore. They were fun to watch. There's there's no doubt about that. So now, of course, uh, who does Kentucky go after? I, I mentioned earlier, if you missed it, I, I personally believe, and this is just my opinion, uh, although I know it's shared by others, I'd go get Bruce Pearl. I would get Bruce Pearl out of Auburn right now. He is everything that you need. I, I truly believe that. He is everything that you need. And, in fact, I I, I don't know, man, but if, it, if he doesn't lie about the Aaron Kraft thing. He's still at Tennessee. He's either still at Tennessee or – He's at, I don't know, Kansas or something, if it doesn't work out, you know, or a blue blood somewhere else. I, I, I don't know, right? Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe he's at Connecticut instead of Dan Hurley. Yeah, always possible. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. By the way, the Kentucky people, you got to make Dan Hurley say no. I don't think Kentucky people understand that Connecticut is now a better program than yours. Historically, perhaps not. But you know what? Even historically, to some degree, it is now getting there. Well, in the last 25, 25 years, yeah. I, I mean, would say. I, Coach Calhoun had them in the Elite Eight. I know when I was in college, I know that year they beat Clemson. Mm-hmm. That was like 1990. Uh, and then he went and got Ray Allen in them, and it took a little while, but he won what? He won three? He won, yes. The he, last one was the Kemble one, and then Kevin Ollie won one on Ollie accident. won one, even if they kind of backdoored into it. I don't care. Guess what they did? They won it. And now, and now Dan Hurley's got his, and I think they're going to win tonight. I certainly I think too. that Purdue can win tonight, but I think Connecticut's going to win. Regardless, Connecticut is playing once again for the National Basketball Championship, and there's this feeling that there's still some kind of rubes that just got lucky. That program gives a lot of you-know-whats about both of its basketball programs. Mm-hmm. And remember, Gino's team quietly, you and I kept saying last week, quietly. Got back to the Final Four, which is where they expect to be. They, they expect their men's program to be mm-hmm. there. And he makes seven and a half. He's going to get a raise regardless. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know why Dan Hurley would take the Kentucky job. And not just because it's Kentucky. Again, he's got a blue blood program now. Kentucky, or Connecticut has turned in to one of those. Um, can you finally pry Mark Few out of Gonzaga? You know, I don't know. Nate Oates just went from a $10 million buyout to an $18 million buyout. I don't know. It's a lot of money to fork Chris over. Beard could be the guy if, you know. By the way, one of the things I heard about Will Wade in terms of why he really apparently did not get a look from Arkansas. It surprises me. Is Well, internally in the, in the conference, mm-hmm. uh, still a lot of anger toward him about what he did and, it still ha- and that show cause that was there. Um, that they don't, they, whoever they is, don't really want that in the league. You take it as you will, but that was one ah, of the yes. things I heard this morning that um, that perhaps there was, so. Uh, but apparently Will Wade didn't, was not on the list. Ah, yes, the SEC, the Conference of Moral Superiority. Sure, just say it. Just take that. Hey, they're, they're lost. Someone's going to get them, and um, someone's going to end up kicking rear with them. Uh, but again, Nate Oates, this is one of the reasons it's surprising because I think Oates, if you fire if you fire Cal, I think you go get Oates. Now that's forty three million in total buyouts at the time a couple of weeks ago. Now with Cal leaving of his own volition, there is no buyout. He doesn't owe them anything either, for what it's worth. Um, Value play. And I've heard I, I heard a couple of people this morning saying, including Andy Staples, say, "Well, Kentucky just saved thirty three million by not firing Cal Perry." Well, did they? You know, I, I ask rhetorically, Elijah, do they have a $33 million John Calipari buyout fund, Ain't, you know, earning like 3.5% as a, in some, you know, 90-day rollover CD? Don't know if it works that way. <laughs> I mean, I don't know that they saved it by not firing him. Because here's why. They didn't fire him because of the $33 million buyout. So I, I just can't look. That's not, to me, that 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 logic doesn't compute. Now, can Kentucky afford to structure an $18 million buyout for Nate Oates? Possibly, yeah. 
does Greg Byrne want to work with Mitch Barnhart to make that happen? If I'm Greg Byrne, I'm like, dude, no. I just signed you. And Absolutely not. Yeah, you know, no, I'm not doing that. So, uh, and again, Billy Donovan, I, I love Billy Donovan. I do. I would urge him not to take this job. Uh, coach the Bulls point. until you get fired. I do mean, that. they're they're at, at this point they're in the playoffs, right? At least the play in the play in. Yeah, um, potentially the playoffs. And I don't think he's going to get fired. He needs to get another couple of players, man. Like, hey, Bulls brass, go get him some players. How about we land on draft picks? Yeah, and start some, there. Something, you know. I mean, it's not all about Billy. Um, Patino coming back. Ugh, stop it. That would be hilarious. Scott Drew, I think, makes a lot of sense. I'm Can not you sure. Prime out of Waco. He's very content there. Yeah, and I'm not sure he's. Is he the Kentucky type? I mean, he, you got to really be. Uh, he's. I'm not saying he's meek. But anyway, he could. But again, Bruce. Bruce Pearl. Good. Bruce yeah. Pearl. Uh, we'll wrap up the drive around the SEC and tell you about another amazing event on this date as the postgame show continues.
Hutton on 7-14. Here's the pitch by Downing. Swinging. There's a drive into left center field. That ball is going to be out of here. It's gone. It's 7-15. There's a new home run champion of all time, and it's Henry Aaron. The fireworks are going. Henry Aaron is coming around third. His teammates are at home plate. And listen to this crowd. The sellout crowd is cheering. Henry Aaron, the home run king of all time. 7-15. Milo Hamilton on the call 50 years ago today. Truly one of the great moments in sports history in the United States. And... I, I'm wearing, for those of you watching on YouTube, I'm wearing my throwback Braves T-shirt today uh, from those uh, those mid-70s teams. Great uniforms. Yeah. When they wear those on Sundays, when the Phillies, and they play the Phillies, and the Phillies wear their baby blue jerseys, yeah. that's the ultimate well, jersey match. You know, that though. cursive A, I, I still, I call it the Hank Aaron hat. Like, yeah. That's, that's what I call that. It's the Hank Aaron hat. Um. I never. I, I've, I've told a funny story. I won't tell it today, uh, but I've told a funny story of how I almost met Hank Aaron, uh, and he walked about two feet behind me, but I couldn't meet him. Missed him by feet. It was terrible. I was like, "Oh my God, Hank Aaron is coming closer to me!" Oh, uh, uh, oh, and Hank Aaron just walked right by me, but I I couldn't meet him. But did you what, watched him. I did. I did. The old CNN Center, uh, downtown Atlanta. Anyway, uh, just. What a, what a, you know, what a day. I mean, look, I don't remember. I was three, but I know of it from years past and, 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 and talking with people like our dear friend, you know, the, the late, great Tommy Moody about this and, and so many others that did see it and did witness it and the things that Hank went through, um, you know, which just, I, I, I don't, I, to, to survive that psychologically and continue to be as productive as he was, uh, is remarkable. It really, it just, it, you know, and, to me, he's going to always be the home run king. Uh, it's not the guy that currently has it. No offense, sir. Reggie Stalker. Just kidding. That says MLB, the show name that they gave him. That'd be uh, Barry Bonds. But, uh, and by the, I always remind people, too, you know, t- a couple things about Hank Aaron. Number one, he is still, all these years later, the career leader and runs batted in in baseball history. The Ribby and, King. And if you took away... His 755 total home runs, 755 of them, Elijah Campbell, he would still have more than 3,000 hits. Wow. He was a pretty remarkable, spectacular baseball player. So, anyway, uh, Hank, hope uh, all those baseball fans up there are loving on you 50 years later. Watching the tape. Just watching it again. Hank's telling him the story. And again, those two hippie dudes who are just, you know, wanted to tell Hank they love him, man. And also, like you mentioned all the stuff that Hank Aaron went through. And for those who don't know, I mean, it is the, uh, the ultimate test of the human spirit, the ultimate fighter, Hank Aaron. But to see two dudes chase after him as he's rounding second with all the threats he got yeah. leading up to breaking Babe Ruth's record. Yeah. How did not a police, how is there not a police officer that ran out there They're and just depleted the them? Man. Yeah. I, how on earth? I don't know. I know security standards are a lot different now in 2024 than they were back then. But my God, dude, you see two two dudes chasing after Hank Aaron after everything you know he has been going through. Very well publicly documented, even yeah. at the time, publicly yeah. documented yeah. the threats he got. Yeah. And you're just going to let them go out there and pat him on the back and lay hands on him? But that's all they wanted to do. I wish we knew who those dudes were. I it's got to be a really good story. Yeah, it about probably somewhere. is somewhere. Jeremy Schapp has, to, has had to, you know, or Tom Rinaldi. Hank gets down to the plate, and, uh, you know, the Braves hoist him up, and he's waving, and then there's his mom, which I just thought was great. Because by then, Hank's, like, almost 40, you know, and there's his mom loving on him, which is just awesome. Uh, it, it's such a cool moment. Such a cool moment. 50 uh, years. 50 years ago today, man. 50 years ago today. Had to be there. One of the one of the best, no no doubt about that. All right, uh, tonight, uh, quick EBPI. Uh, speaking of history, uh, Connecticut yeah. could make. Now, people have done it before, but it's been a while. Duke in ninety one, ninety two, Florida oh six oh seven. Mm-hmm. So UConn going for it, the rare back to backer. But Purdue wants to do uh, Virginia 
after uh, losing to a 16 a year ago. He so, also makes some extra history. Yeah, and Zach Eady wants his. Uh, this is going to be a good game. The EBPI says what? Yeah, and the Big Ten had won a title since 2000, and they've lost their last seven national title game appearances. So that's a fun conference stat there. But yeah. the EBPI says that streak continues. UConn 71%, Ooh. I would say, over Purdue. Purdue is really, really good. I think they've been one of the best teams all year. And when I filled up my bracket, I had Purdue winning it all because I figured surely UConn might stumble if they played Auburn. I thought Auburn wouldn't be a great matchup for UConn defensively, but we never got to see that now, did we? So now with UConn in this game, the way they're playing, they've won, what, 10 straight NCAA tournament games by double digits? And it was tied with Alabama with about, what, 12 and a half minutes to go, and they outscored them 30 to 16. Yeah. UConn does what, you know, this year's South Carolina women's team does in terms of having just like flip-off sessions where it's like, oh, you're tied with me for a little bit? Oh, well, here's a 15-0 run, all right? Now let's play basketball. Like, you you see, you know, snap your fingers, bam. There's 15 straight points. UConn does that really, really well. The big matchup, though, Donovan Klingon versus Zach Eady. This is a Ralph Sampson versus uh, Patrick Ewing type big man battle. We don't see a lot of this, so enjoy it. Should be a fun game. Yeah, hope you stay awake for it because it's at 920. Drink some coffee. Yeah, do what you got to do. Good stuff, sir. Glad you got back in one piece, at least barely in one piece. Barely. Good stuff today. We'll do it all again tomorrow. See y'all.